authority to get, uh, to, to order Monday, May 9th, excuse me, May. I wish it was May, November 19, 2018, 6 o'clock in the council chambers. Roll call, please. <coughs> Commissioner Arnone. Commissioner Bosco. Commissioner Sakala. Here. Commissioner Cassati. Commissioner Davis. Commissioner Denning. Here. Commissioner Fall. Here. Chairman Ludwig. Here. Commissioner Muller. Here. Vice Chairman Suzak. Here. Commissioner Ungeyer. Here. We have seven commissioners present for or absent. Item number four, or first item, special guest Wooden Kern and their presentation. Folks, please come up. And just your name and title would be great. Jay Sheehan with Woodard and Curran. We're at 1699 uh, sure. Elm Street in Enfield. Toby Fetter with Woodard and Curran. Welcome. Mr. Mayor, uh, just by way of introduction, we had had a um, special meeting as well, I think the month before last, and there were questions from the public in regard to water pollution control rates. Uh, so we had promised as a result of those questions to bring Woodward, Woodard and Kern here because they were our consultants and advised the council over the years um, in regard to the present structure. I also have present uh, Donald Nunes from Public Works, the director, in case any questions need to be directed to him, and also John Wilcox, who wasn't here during the uh, inception of the program, but has certainly been here during the um, uh, last couple of years uh, during the implementation so that I think that will cover the bases. Hopefully they can do their presentation. Council could inquire of any clarifications and then we provide it again as we said we would a public section so they can make comments. There won't be a back and forth of answering as we don't do that in public communication but we will again take down those questions and provide answers and put it on our website. This also will go on our website this presentation tomorrow. Great. So I turn it over to Woodard and Curran. Welcome gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we have a pretty, well, it's, it's a robust agenda in some ways, so bear with us for a little bit. We don't expect to go on for 20 minutes, but it, it may be a solid 10. Um, we will talk about the WPCA compliance timeline and why we're, why we're where we are, the evolution of the costs and the evolution of, of the rate system. Uh, definitions, we want to be clear, because we we've been listening to the hearings that we weren't at, and we've heard a lot of confusion from the public and others, so we want to make sure we're very clear on what the definitions are of things. We'll talk about the rate system decisions, the rationale, the process, and especially the 2014 rates that were established and then the 2019 increase, fiscal year 2019, which is this year, and then options moving forward and benchmarking. Great. So real quick, just to look at the compliance timeline, why the whole project started. Uh, in 1938, the, the WPCF and the collection system was built. In 95 was the last major upgrade to the system. So it's been, a, you know, 20 plus years before anything's been done. Uh, and even that last major upgrade wasn't a full upgrade. It was just a piece of process that was handled. So it's been closer to 40 years before things have happened at the plant. As a result of that, there was a series of notice of violations that the DEP issued to the town of Enfield. February 21st, 2012 was the, the last one, and it was the fifth one. Um, those notice of violations can result in up to a $25,000 per day fine for not being in compliance. So this is what the town was facing. To show you the list of deficiencies, it's pretty extensive. We won't go through every one, but just know that there are five notice of violations, and then all these deficiencies were identified by the DEP. So there, there was a lot of work that had to be done back in 2012. So at that point, the town in October 20, 2012 said, this is a little over our head, so they need to hire a consultant. So they went into a public process, RFQ, qualification, actually it was a cost-based selection on a capital study and rate plan. And we were selected in a competitive bid to uh, do that first project. The first deadline for NOV compliance was January 2014. Again, by complying then, we wrote a little report to DEP that said, Everything's fine, so that avoided a $25,000 fee. Then in May 2015, we had another compliance deadline. Again, these, these fees are avoided. Uh, then in November 2015, famously, the $36 million sewer referendum passed, which is significant because that allowed for the funding to do some of the corrective measures that DEP was requiring. In November 2017, there was a, a deadline to do some construction improvements, but because of the good faith that the town showed, because of the way you handled the rates and going to a rate system, they extended that. So the fines don't kick in. 
Uh, construction began this year, June 2018. And finally, we expect July 2020, the, the improvements to be completed. DP actually has a $50,000 per day on, on those type of things, if those are not completed by then. So we're, we're on schedule. And again, because of the good faith the town has showed, if something changes with the schedule, DP's been there along the way, and they're ready to, to react and support the town. So um, my name's Toby Fetter, as I said, and I uh, was intimately involved in the completion of the rate study and presented a number of times. Um, I've provided a, a quick just timeline of the costs that the WPCA is incurred in the course of, uh, really in the course of operations and where those funds have come from. On the furthest left, you see the blue period is when ad valorem taxes were being used to fully fund operations. Uh, that was in fiscal 13, ending halfway through fiscal 14. At that time, the ad valorem taxes uh, were generating around $3.1 million in operating funds per year. Um, the, the big one, one of the big pictures here being the change over time and the actual capital needs of the uh, utility, capital and operational costs. Um, the red star there, the one thing I will point out, when you made the switch from ad valorem over to an actual rate base revenue generation scheme, the, the WPCA had amassed a $3.6 million debt to the town general fund. Okay, and so when we established rates, uh, that was there on the books, and when we set the rates for the first five years, the goal was to begin to pay that off, and uh, as well as support operations. And so what you can see then is for the period from 2014 through the recently ended 2018, we had basically a two-tier rate structure that was volumetric purely, and that generated around $4.8 million per year. Now, the initial rate set recommendations were for about $5.3 million a year in overall rate uh, revenue generation, but um, decisions just made by the council to adjust for water time usage in the summer and watering and things along those lines reduced the actual revenue generation of the structure by something to the tune of around $450,000 per year. So the actual revenue generation is around $4.8 million pretty consistently through that four-year period. Basically, in fiscal 19, this is where we have a big jump. And in uh, commensurate with that jump, we knew we needed to reset, basically, or, or at least restructure the way that we are generating revenue. And you can see that we've jumped from a $4.8 million generation to somewhere up in the range of $7 million. Now, some of that, and we'll discuss this later on, was changed during the, um, during the budgetary process. But when we set rates in April, that was the number that we were targeting. And as you recall, the switch there was simply to bring in uh, fixed charges uh, that were applied on a quarterly basis to customers based upon meter size, which is a very, very frequent practice in, in both water and wastewater industries. So to Jay's earlier point, uh, we did want to address, based on some of the things that we saw in the replay, the differences between a tax and a user fee. So a tax is basically a charge imposed by an authority and is levied on the value of either income or property owned. The ad valorem obviously is a tax levied upon real property, and that is what was used, as we said, through 2013. Now, Everything else, and those can be flat fees, they can be fixed charges, they can be volumetric charges, within the industry are defined as user fees. Um, and it is a user fee is defined as a charge that's imposed to a customer, and it can be based on either fixed or volumetric uh, characteristics. And in truth, the, the recompletion, or at least the revisiting of the original rate study, was used to help us identify a, an appropriate blend, or at least a blend of charges and volumetric rates which would generate the volume of money that we needed every year. Okay. So just a little bit more history of the rate program. So in 2013, the as, as I mentioned, there was an RFQ to go out to find a consultant to help with the rate study. So we were selected for that. And that was on March 15th, we presented Council WPCA with a recommendation um, for rates. And it was a full financial review of the utility. We benchmarked Enfield against other utilities. We looked at the capital improvement recommendations, and it's you know, important to note that uh, we had recommended actually $42 million in capital, and in working with some of the steering committee, it was reduced down to $36 million. So 
Enfield was getting a good, you know, a good um, value, if you will. We recommended at that time a flat user fee. So that means, as Toby described, that's a flat rate, you know, X dollars per year for the users. In view of ad valorem, that was our recommendation, or in lieu of. The town at the time, and, and town manager was very strong on equity. And that was the feeling that he had from the council in WPCA, is that equity, it was not equitable to charge a single person in a home and a family in a home the same amount, that it should be volumetric. So we said, great, we still can do that. It's all about raising enough revenue. So we went back to the drawing board, we adjusted the financial model, and came up with a, a uh, system for that, a volumetric you know, consumption-based system. So the other thing that's important to note, and there's been a lot of kind of conjecture about how we got from ad valorem. It's very clear. This is not, unamb this is not ambiguous. Chapter 103 of the, of the state code um, section 7267 on use of funds says that sewer funding shall be kept separate from other kinds of funding in a municipality. So Enfield wasn't doing that. That meant that the plant ran down. So for 40 or 50 years, you were not funding the plant the way a normal WPCA would fund the plant. And that's just a fact. Um, and it was before, you know, we were all there. So to get Connecticut DEP funding, which on this project is $6 million in grants, and about a $24 million 2% loan under the state revolving funds, there's a requirement to capture these funds, a durable, and those are important words, a durable and dedicated revenue stream is required. So that's where some different type of funding system has to happen. Furthermore, um, well, so the, in 2013, the town manager recommended that, and town council WPCA approved a consumption-based sewer system and the ad valorem system that had underfunded the WCA, as Toby mentioned, by about 3.6 million. So that was borrowed to just pay. So now that had to be paid back. Because of all this con you know, conversation about why did we even change, uh, your finance director, John Wilcox, went directly back to DP and said, did we have to do this? And so on November 9th, uh, DP answered the question. And it was Jen Perry, who was the assistant director of infrastructure management with DP. She said, and, and this is a quote, Enfield must remain on a dedicated user charge system in order to maintain CWF financing. Staff would also recommend an increase in rates to address the deficiencies, ensure the effective operation and maintenance of the system. So she went a little further by saying raise the rates, but that, that wasn't the question. Um, and then, as mentioned, there's even state regs, um, 22A-482, which would make an ad valorem system, if, if Enfield switched back, would make you ineligible for that $6 million in grants and the, uh, the loan amounts. So we just, we've just we heard a lot about that. We saw it at the meeting, and we just want to make sure it's very right. clear that this wasn't a flip decision, and it was a recommendation from staff. So after the rate study capital plan, uh, council modified sewer Article 86, and then WPCA council approved rates, finance uh, consum consumptive billing in 2014, the sewer fee schedule was amended to reduce the connection fees. So we had a certain target. We reduced the connection fees. We gave some allotments for there. Then there was a reduction for irrigation and pools. So we took a little bit more out of the, the revenue we're trying to generate. Just to be clear, though, those were not what are Kern's recommendations. Those were decisions right. taken independent of our council. We always support whatever council WPCA does, so we'll, we always uh, go back to the drawing board, tell you the, imp you know, we have memos on each of those situations, we worked with town management, et cetera. But, you know, it's not, that wasn't our recommendation. On April 8th, 2015, council was provided, so the council at that point, so now you're a few years into it, um, asked the finance director at the time, Lynn Nenny, to do a five-year quarterly update. So how are we doing on, on revenues? We were not involved in that either, but... Um, she reported back. In June 2017, we were asked, Gordon Kern was hired again to do a three-year finance audit to check back in. So that's where we got to today. So that's important to provide the context. In the spring, we came back with a recommendation after our audit, and Council WPCA said that we should have a bipartisan subcommittee and have some meetings. And there were four total meetings, two subcommittee meetings and then two with WPCA Council. And then at that point, new rates with fixed charges began. But those are a few meetings, but we've had more than 16 meetings with council and WPCA 
since this rate issue came up. So again, there was some kind of intimation from, or you know, from the public or whoever that said this happened under the cover of darkness. There were 16 meetings with, you know, right. council and WPCA. So we didn't sneak anything by anyone. This is all all up and up. Um, okay. <clears throat> sure. So um, basically, the the fiscal 18 financial audit. Um, Effectively, you know, we went back and we took a look at what the revenue performance had been, why we had um, why we had the delta between the 5.3 rate, uh, the the 5.3 revenue generation that was in the original rate design, and the 4.8 that was actually occurring between 2014 2018. Um, but in, in essence, we came back, we documented the performance. In truth, the the, the rates were working with exception of the modifications done afterwards, pretty much as intended, which gives us a lot of, uh, a lot of confidence in, in the model itself. But basically where we stand now at the end of fiscal 18 is that we still have about two and a half million dollars to repay to the general fund. That's from the original 3.6 million. And it was always intended that the, the, um, the revenue generation of the 2014 rate set would do that. It just was originally intended it would do it more quickly um, because it would have you know increased the revenues. Um, but again, to my point earlier, the big change that happened as part of the rate setting that came out of the, the sort of the, uh, the audit was looking at the coming fiscal cycle, fiscal 19 that we've just entered and we've adopted the, the new rate structure for. Um, in effect, we went from a situation where we knew we had a rate structure that would generate 4.8 million. We were going to a situation where we identified a need to generate 6.75. As I indicated, um, you guys, uh, meaning the council and the WPCA board, made some modifications to your budget, um, and you also made some modifications to the recommended rates that came out of the rate update. We wrote a memo in June, uh, and I'd be happy to hand these out a little bit later, both the, uh, the actual rate study report as well as the memo in june they told where we basically indicated to mr bilmus what we thought the likely financial outcome of the adopted rates was and i'll hand those out at the end of the meeting but in essence we think your current rates are going to generate around 6.2 um, that would look like a five hundred and fifty thousand dollar deficit but you've also cut spending significantly and as long as we aren't going to be trying to pay down debt um, in truth, you're going to be probably fairly close this year. Uh, we did, um, uh, working with, with Mr. Wilcox, we, we took a look at your financials year to date, and the revenue generation of, of the program is working as expected to generate a little bit over $6.2 million. So we feel confident that, that you'll be able to land the ship as long as we don't have an upset in uh, in, in really the, the consumption that's used in the latter part of the year. Now, a big part of the jump in revenues, of course, because you only changed your, uh, your volumetric rates quite minimally, uh, in, increased by 1.2%, the big jump in revenues between that $4.8 million number and the 6.75 revised to 6.2 is all associated with the fixed charges um, that were instituted as part of the fiscal cycle. Um, and so, that basically being where we are, the big thing to note here is we can foresee knowing what your future debt service requirements are going to be and adding those on to your existing operating budgets. And the debt service, just to be clear, as Jay indicated, the financing package from CT Deep is for 2.4 million at 2%. So those, the, the I'm sorry? 24. 24, oh, I did say 2.4, pardon me. At 2.0% and um, Obviously, as the construction proceeds, you're going to need to begin to pay on that note, similar to having a mortgage. And we need to account for that when we start to design rates for the future and uh, estimate what we're going to need to raise from our, from our revenue structures. Do you want to talk about the study before you move on? Oh, yes. Just to be very clear, my apologies, Jay, on this figure that you see in, uh, in front of you on the right-hand side of this slide, we know that the uh, study was recently uh, completed by Novak a Company, uh, recommending some changes to the budgeting. Uh, those are not included within the numbers that are on this slide. Um, we could include them, and in truth, if the, the town decides to enact those changes, we will need to modify the expectations for the future. In truth, it would drive up costs by about a half million dollar a year is uh, the closest that, we can, that we've heard right now, so. So just going back to the bipartisan subcommittee for a moment, <clears throat> that was March 5th. Um, there's, the members are listed. 
And there was a very um, clear goals that the subcommittee tried to define. So to fully break even in fiscal year 2019, so break even. So you're really doing that, as Toby suggests, due to state impacts on town budget, of course, too. Fully fund operational capital costs at WPCA. Make sure it was equitable. That's an important piece. So that's we'll get back to that in a second. Repay to the deficit to the general fund over time. And we're not paying down as much as perhaps we, we would like at the moment because of some other choices. But we're, we're still, um, you know, funding at, at um, current rates. And then build adequate reserves. And that's the other thing that's not happening. We're not really building reserves as it goes. So with that, you know, there were options. The volumetric rate increase. So right now you had volumetric, so it's measured consumption, and you could just increase the rate at which you're multiplying the multiplier for the consumption. Uh, that was one way. It would have to go as much as 40%, which is a pretty big number. And then it would have to go up over time. Then there's fixed charges, which are the, the meter fees, which we also clearly hear people aren't thrilled with meter fees. But that's a very common practice in the industry because fixing a certain part of the budget gets you away from this, you know, the water cycle and people using more, using less, using more. So you have a fixed income and then you have some volumetric for equity. And that also um, mattered because there's a lot of people paying minimums. And the minimum was absurdly low from the, from the way it was started. $13 a quarter. $13 a quarter, which is, you know, just, just really low. And you'll see because we'll compare to some other towns. Then there was, we could just do what we originally recommended, which just go to a flat rate, just a, a certain number that would go to every resident, uh, residential user, and that would be the same for the single family or the single individual that lived in a home. Uh, or we could return to ad valorem, even for a portion of, you know, maybe just the capital, but that's certainly not a preferred option because we saw DP's strong feelings on, on ad valorem. It would represent about a 2.31 mil rate increase, but we don't, we're not sure we can even do it, to be honest, with DP. Um, so, equitability. So, what, what did the subcommittee decide? The subcommittee liked a combination of a volumetric rate increase and establishing a fixed charge. So that combination would kind of mollify that, that big change. So, um, in, in the end, obviously, on, on the left-hand side of the table there, uh, you see what we recommended coming out of the rate study uh, from the standpoint of generating uh, the adequate level of revenues that we were targeting based on the original budgets. Again, as I said, this was done in April. Um, after the budgeting went through, and, and I believe the WPCA Board and Council considered um, you elected to reduce the fixed charge from $10 a month for the 5 8 inch meter customer down to $7 a month. And you took our, our recommended volumetric rate increase from 3% down to 1.2%. Um, so those were the basically the, the two primary things. We also made some adjustments based upon three years of actual billings to, um, to reflect some well water customers actual probable usage based on similar characteristics of similar uh, customers and uh, obviously the changes between the two the first set was designed to generate just under seven million dollars um, and the second set is we believe going to likely generate you just under six and a quarter million dollars in the current fiscal cycle and so really the the you know, we received a lot of feedback that you wanted to know what some options might be. And so what we've provided on this table is basically some fiscal year numbers for the current fiscal cycle, next fiscal cycle, and then also just out to fiscal 2023 after the debt service is fully rolled onto the budget. Because after that point, the escalation of the rates is unlikely to be quick because at that point you'll be dealing with basically um, you'll just be dealing with the inflation on, on salaries and, and certain other portions of the budget, as opposed to whole new sectors coming onto the budget like debt service and large capital outlays. So just, just to describe this table effectively, what this shows is in the 2019, you have two bars. You have the recommended, which was gonna generate $6.99 million, had a $10 monthly charge, and then that was your blend of rates. And then if you, with the adopted, we're going to generate $6.23 million with a $7 charge and basically a slightly lower set of volumetric rates. Now, just to be clear, 
Um, and there are some notes at the bottom of the table that describe what we've done here. We were asked to be able to provide a guidance level. These wouldn't be numbers that I'd want you to go to the bank with right now, but they're going to be quite close. We basically pulled out the, the residential revenue generation. So if you wanted to go with a flat fee along the lines of some of the other communities in the area, this is what we would be looking at for basically the current fiscal cycles. What we would have been looking at was a 300 to $310 charge. And then in each of the next couple fiscal cycles, both with a the original projection and then the original projection with the actual cost associated with the Novak study added on. So just um, wanted to give you guys some understanding of what you might be looking at under different scenarios going forward. And again, this, this table or this chart really just shows you where we've been. We, we were at a fairly low comparatively revenue generation under the ad valorem. We took a big <laughs> jump up. When we uh, instituted the first set of rates, we're taking another big jump up as part of this fiscal cycle because that's what the, what's going on with the spending. And that's going to drift up through fiscal 23 as debt service from the construction projects that are currently underway rolls on to the budget. So as we do this, and I, just a few more slides, so bear with us. We always want to look at benchmarking because you can do it in a vacuum and you could look at how it works in Enfield and you got to say, well, geez, is this comparable. So we, we did that in a couple different ways. So we're benchmarking the capital improvement cost of the plant. That's the first thing. So when you look at Enfield, it's one of the bigger plants that's been done. These are, these are essentially all the plant upgrades that have happened over the last 10 years. Um, Enfield, and, and this is not escalated money. So these were the costs at the time they did the project. So note that something that happened in 2012 for 42 million would probably be closer to 50 plus million today in today's dollars. But we did not escalate. You can see Enfield's 36 million for a 10 MGD plant, 10 MGD being a pretty large plant, is very reasonable compared to, say, a Torrington, which is going 72 million, going on right now. They just bid it, and they had to rebid it because they couldn't afford it, um, but it didn't get much better. And that's starting in 20, or starting this year, and that's a smaller plant. So you, you got a good, a decent value from your, your staff and team that, that put this together. Looking at rates, it's important to look also there. Um, what we did is we have a lot. I mean, it's, we'll hand this out after as well so you can have it. But you can see that all the comparable communities are listed on this table. We put their mill rates, their fiscal 19 mill rates, so you can compare. Enfield's at 33.4. But I think you'll see that that's, you know, you look at that. You look at that anyway when you do the budget. But it's pretty, pretty comparable to uh, your neighbors. And then when you look at the average monthly bill, the 2014 to 2018 rate was one of the lowest of these comparable neighbors. So it was, it was the third lowest at about $264. This is the volumetric rate. We just made the adjustment, or you just made the adjustment, to 350 which put, still keeps you in the top or the lowest third of rates of sewer in, in these towns. And then what we probably have to move to, to, to be responsible on the, on the volumetric for 2023, it's still, you know, it's it's not the highest in the state. It's not the lowest in the state, but it's 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 a little above the the midpoint. So just just as a point of reference, and then we were trying to benchmark that against other utilities. So this is current annual residential utility charges for Enfield residents. Roughly in electric, you pay about fifteen hundred and forty-two dollars a year. The average user. This is just a average. Cable TV is about nine hundred and eighty a year. Cell phones are about seven twenty. Hazardville water, you're getting quite a bargain. It's 450 for those who live in Hazardville. Connecticut water is about 750, so it's a $300 swing between the two utilities. And then sewers right now, $350. So just just to have some kind of you know context to what that is. So just in closing, you have some options going forward. You could stay with the current rate system, adding in fixed charges and raising it over time, either fixed charges or the, or the rates, or both combinations. You can go to a flat rate, which would be um, 360 per year per residential user. That's the midpoint we see, which would rise to about 500 in 2023. And, and to do that, we'd really highly recommend another bipartisan subcommittee to kind of understand that and look at, the, look at the costs. Or, and we don't even know if this is possible, but you could go, back, go to a mill rate increase of 2.31 
but you have to. We know that you would have to stay with rates for some portion of it because DP will not allow you to do just just mil, you know ad valorem. But th you could explore that, and that would certainly require a lot more uh, looking. And and then the last thing to just say is that you know I think sometimes consultants are are you know and we heard a lot of words, but um, blamed for being the bearers of bad news. We, we don't feel good about that. And, and more importantly, we are residents of the town of Enfield. So we pay these rates as residential commercial users, or both, because we have employee, we have 20 employees in our office. We have some that live in Enfield and own houses. So they pay these rates, and then our company pays the rates. So we're not profiting from these rate increases. So any suggestions of such, it's, it's just not. This hurts us as much as it hurts other people. So with that, any questions? Well, again, uh, fantastic. So, just for the public, when this will be out on the website tomorrow. Tomorrow, and any other questions we receive, we'll put out there. I think they've done a thorough job of giving the historical because you know this happened over a course of many years. Some of you were here, some weren't. Some residents were, some weren't. So it, it's kind of tough when you're looking at it in a patchwork fashion. This, I think, is a very good presentation of where we were where we need to go. I'd, I would just like to stress that one of the important things, we are at about a status quo, understanding because their recommended rates weren't completely adopted because council and WPC and the subcommittee gave some consideration, understand that that debt of the 2.5 million we owe to the general fund is out there. And it's kind of like your mortgage. You know, maybe the bank would say, I know you're going through hard times, don't make your mortgage payment, all right? But you still owe it. So we're at this point going forward, maybe we won't be able to make any payments towards that. You're still going to have your operational costs, your, your electricity, your oil, all the other things you have to do at your home. I'll also say, though, one of the goals, and from my perspective, I, I think this is well thought out by the council and the subcommittee. When I look at it, I think the combination that you chose was equitable, equitable and fair. It addressed what we needed to do, and we're out there building that plant for the benefit of the town. It'll be done in two years. And we had a... I'm not going to say a gun to our head, but we certainly had a sword lifted over us by the DEP with those fines because we were so grossly out of compliance. So I think everybody acted appropriately here from the council to Woodard and Curran. But I will let you know, if we keep it right now, as he said, we're, we're keeping just above water. We're not going to pay our debt service. But of concern, under and John... Uh, Wilcox has some handouts about what DEP expects and requires. One of them is that you properly maintain your plant and that you have sufficient money to address emergency situations. So understand, because we sort of gave a short-term hiatus and didn't fully implement their recommendations, we're not really having much to pay the debt service, and we're not doing the fund, the reserve fund that we had, you had targeted to be about, about I think, a million two, a million five. What does that mean? It means if we have an emergency or there are repairs at the plant, you're going to again have to borrow a home equity loan to do them, and your mortgage, which is now $2.5 million that we owe the town, will go up. So I think in the long term, you know, better to do it appropriately and look at it during the next budget season. And to that end, uh, I think we, that's where we should discuss it. If you want to consider a flat rate, we can get more information for them by the end of the year. If you want to continue where we are, um, the only wild card is the Novak report. I don't want to get into that. We've talked about it at the subcommittee. But basically, we, throw, we, f we froze three positions in the water pollution control. So here you're going to have a brand new plant minus three people to maintain it and to do repairs on it. Not really advisable. And they are actually recommending even an increase. So part of what we're talking about is when we do these projects like the high school or JFK or we place boilers, you've got to maintain them. You've got to have adequate staff and resources to maintain them, or we're going to find ourselves again in this situation, you know, in the future where we didn't, and it's going to be cost prohibitive again. Better to perhaps swallow the poison pill address their concerns in the upcoming budget, maybe do your incremental up to 2023, paying back our debt, putting away the rainy day fund, and having appropriate people to maintain the facility. So we can discuss those because our intent is to keep water pollution control on every month. We're not going to go back to the absentee lord uh, landlord situation. I am going to the meetings. Uh, Director Nunes is. We'll keep you updated on the rates. John will keep you updated in governance on the revenues. And we'll keep you updated on the progress of, of all of this. But more importantly, during the budget, now you kind of know what the picture is. I think it's fair. 
Um, and I think, as always, there are some concerns you can tweak little things. But we have a set amount of money we have to raise every year, and there's only two ways to do it. The way you're doing it or going to a flat fee, but there's no way to escape it. And we can't go, to, uh, go back to the past where we're just borrowing from the general fund and putting our head in the sand and not properly maintaining it or paying for the upgrades that are due. We're going to have a brand new spanking new plant, and we should take care of it, we should maintain it, and we should have people to do it, and we should have a fund without having to steal from Peter to pay Paul going forward. Again, it's part of our plan to be transparent with the public, to be honest with them, and to have a long-range plan going forward to address these things so the next council or your grandchildren on the council uh, won't have to grapple with these issues because we'll plan so well we'll have a surplus. And the goal, too, is to have a Q&A document where we put this up. Well, what we'll do is this is going to the, go up. The definitions is great. I mean, that's yep. a great. That's another great thing. So, folks, if they have a question, they can send it. We can put it right out yeah. the website. Yeah, and we'll, we'll update right. that. I think this addresses all the questions we've had to date as to the why, the where, how come we're here. Right. Um, there's some handouts. We'll hand out the presentation as well. We have uh, copies for the for the public, and we'll put it up tomorrow. And whatever that generates, we'll answer those every single month. But I think this hopefully yeah. answers a lot very, of the very questions. Very good presentation. Very good. Any questions from members of the council? I, I had just a general question, and again, I'm sorry, because I was back here in the 90s when we got underfunded by the from the pilot money, and um, still still to this day it bugs me. They owe us $2.3 million a prison system. Uh, do we, so when we have the next meeting, I want to make sure we have an update when, when they're going to go to OPM. And then, then the question becomes, when, so in your timeline, when did the prisons open from 1938 to 1995, which was one of the major changes, you know, to the cost of running the water pollution control? You know, I don't, I don't remember, I, Paul, I should know this, but I don't remember we opened the prisons in, in town. And, and, it's 60, and so, then the, so then the question becomes through this, as we look through this, and I saw, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, the volume, the, I'm going to use the, M, the MGD or MGB, you call it? Mil million gallons per day. With, with, the, with the potential of that plant when it's done, how do we or can we start surrounding towns, taking over theirs, and start generating some additional revenue with the size of that? And I, I'm, a, I'm a novice, so I apologize. But M, MBG, MGD, B, whatever you guys call it. I mean, there's an opportunity, I, I'm going to say, where we can actually maybe take other other towns and maybe generate a fee so we're not asking the t our taxpayers to, to, to fund what obviously is what we're going to have to fund over the next 10 years. Right. So I just want you don't have to give me an answer or if you but if you want to it'd be great. So what you're referring to is generally known as regionalization right. and it's um, increasingly seen for municipal utilities that used to go on their own simply because by all means there is definitely economies of scale to be had in the wastewater you know conveyance and treatment business. So can we maybe as we get, I don't know if this is through the town manager, maybe start coming up with a plan and maybe asking some surrounding towns as we go into the budget next year, if, even if it's one or two towns? And I, I will say that it, during the facilities plan, we explored a little bit of that. Uh, we looked at Summers, mm -hmm. and they have a small plant that if they need an upgrade, they're going to want to do right, something yeah, different. Right. And we're very close to their sewer line, so it would be very easy to, to connect to them. So we've had a conversation with their prior first select woman. Um, it's something to keep at. You know, it's something to keep talking about. There's definitely some sewer issues in Suffield, particularly Lake Congamon, right. which is a little closer. It's a little far away. But um, they don't, you know, have the wherewithal to bring it to their plant. So there's some there's some opportunities, in other words. There's some okay. things that could happen. Just so maybe for a future agenda and a while. Because I we'll agree with you. I want to We'll meet, explore that. Okay, on a monthly basis so we can update. And the two other items in regard to what the state owes us uh, under the DOC agreement, we have talk to our consultant, Fusno O'Neill. They're going to report to me in the morning to find out, you know, when and how it's going to go on the state bonding commission uh, for action. So we'll have an update on that. And I think, Mayor, what I'm going to do, too, there was a very good article today in the Connecticut Mirror on the pilot program. I don't think people understand what it is. Right. The pilot program is payment, payment in lieu of taxes. So we have large state facilities in, in our town, it, you, and we can't tax them. It was unfair. So many decades ago when it was, you know, put into place, they said, well, we're going to come up with a, it's going to be less than your property tax, but it's going to be a payment in lieu of taxes that the state will pay you to reimburse. We're using your roads, we're in your town, and other impacts, so we'll come up with a formula. So the article today talked about the broken promise, because the state 
from the 100 percent of the pilot program, which again was a fraction of what it would have been if we could have taxed, say, a corporation or a distribution center, has steadily declined from down to 40 percent. I think currently the article today, and I read it quickly before the meeting, is 18 to 20 and reducing. So, I mean, if they just honored that obligation, we would be able to meet ours much right. more easily. And if we actually went back and looked at the deal that was negotiated back in the 90s. Right. Like early so that, that, that we broken were, promise is caused, and it's been reduced every year, and last year most significantly reduced. Whether it will be restored, I, I cannot say. But it's important for the residents to know that, that was a promise made by the state that hasn't been kept. And as a result, it has been a shift to the property tax where you've had to raise it to address that deficit and shortfall. But an excellent article, if you go on the Connecticut Mirror, it was in today, and they're wondering what will this next legislature and governor do about that. So, so I, I'll just say, a fantastic presentation. I think this is exactly what we needed to actually go back in history to let folks know over the last X amount, because I think there was a lot of confusion when this was packed, passed back in 2014. So again, I appreciate the detail and the timeline, and, and quite frankly, the basically getting from A to B equals C, which is what I think this is exactly what we need to do. We're trying to educate folks on why we're doing certain things. So I don't have any questions. This was, I, I'm glad I want to make sure that everyone knows. I don't, I don't know if we have to put a press release out saying, listen, go to this. Here it is at the website. So, again, it will help even the definitions alone for folks because, again, I think that's the biggest thing is that people get confused on the definitions. And, again, I, I, like I said, I, I don't blame consultants. I appreciate that you've come here and done this because I think this has been very helpful. So I appreciate it. And thank you for bringing them, uh, Deputy Mayor Suzak. I'm sorry, Commissioner Suzak. How about if we just put in their next door bill that this is available on the website? And I will tell you, I, I pay a lot of these bills. And, you know, the minimum one is now, what, $17.21. And then you have the $21 um, service fee. So, you know, and, and I'll tell you, the mid ones didn't change that much. My well, mid bills. They well, just. I think I'm, all I'll say is that I'm not. But clearly, both parties over the last X amount of years have been trying to be very fair. So whether you agree or disagree with it, and that's fine. But both parties clearly tried to be fair to the taxpayer, because I think I agree with you. The way they, the way where the subcommittee selected the volume and, and the rate showed a, an understanding that they understand folks can't pay a $300 flat charge. I mean, I think that's the reality of the situation. So. Certainly we'll take the criticism, but I, I, I'd rather get criticized for both parties trying to be fair. So I think, you know, over the last X amount of years. And, and so I, th I think, you know, and you can see from the original recommendation, when they lowered the initial recommendation of revenue, uh, in high, on high insight, you know, we, maybe we wish they didn't do it, but at the time, we've been in a recession for a number of years in this part of the, town, the state. I mean, I know the rest of the state maybe just started joining the party. But we've been in a recession for a while, so I, I don't criticize a past council for taking into, a, into account what people's ability to pay in both sides. So I think, I, I mean, I, I have to admit, I, I think both parties should be at least somewhat resolved the fact they've tried to be very fair. And that's all. Yeah. Uh, when, you, when you came up with your original uh, estimate for revenue, mm. um, and you took into account the fact that in the summer people use more water, I guess, because when we took it out, it hurt your estimate. That, that's correct. And wh so, why didn't you take that into account in the first place? Because people water their lawns, people wash their cars, people fill their pools. Why would you include that in there in the first place? Sure. So, you know, communities are allowed to adopt policies as they see so fit. We were not instructed to include it in the rate study. So, generally speaking, you know, when you're attempting to, you know, attempting to um, you know, get a projection of a revenue stream and you have only one sort of weighing device, so to speak, that being water meters. We used the one weighing device that we had, which is the water meter readings for three years from Hazardville water and Connecticut water to, um, to basically generate how many bills of sewerage were going to be used. Now, the, the sort of the side impact of when you, when you make a blanket application of, of um, saying, well, we're going to say you only use 90 percent of your water as sewer every summer and you apply that equally to all customers, it doesn't change the revenue that's derived from any single customer, right? Because but you, apparently you, it did. Well, <laughs> it, it did, but that was after we'd set rates. Mm -hmm. If you had told me going in into the 2014 rate study that we want you to assume that, you know, we'll only build 90 
uh, 90 gallons per every 100 gallons of water on the sewer side, we would have adjusted the actual consumption that went into the model and you would have ended up with a higher volumetric rate just applied to fewer gallons. But the dollars would have been the same because the rates are always designed to generate enough money to cover the utility's costs. What I can't understand though is you're the experts. You do this all the time and yet you made a false assumption and now we're in a hole. I'm not sure that's an accurate characterization. I could take you to many communities in, in Connecticut that don't adjust summer consumption, and I could take you to others that do. Well, so that, know, that's, a, that's, a, that's a selection made by the community. Well, well, and I, I think obviously, and Mike pointed it out, the fact that the committee and the council or the Water Pollution Control Authority took that into account for the fact that people weren't putting it down the sewer line. It was going to grass. I was one of those that came before them and complained because I didn't want to have to pay taxes. It, my normal bill was like 80 bucks for three months. In the summertime, I'm five to seven hundred dollars. You kidding me? Pay a, a, a fee, a sore fee on what's going into grass at that amount? I, I, I'm not saying you're not re reasonable in that expectation, but we, when I'm asked to set rates, I do have to make some assumptions. And and in light of the data that we had available, and so just just to be very Stay clear. clear. In the 2018 study, that was taken into account. So the rates that are now in force, that was taken into account on the revenue generation. In the original study completed in 2013, we had no basis to understand what what a sort of adjustment would be made. We know that quite a few folks have put in deduct meters at this point, uh, and and appropriately so. You know, I I take I, I have no. Um, I'm really agnostic as to what policies the town should be allowed to allow people to put in. But it's, I, I'm here to try and help you understand in order to raise revenues of X number of dollars, here are a set of rates that will do so with a given set of policies. And some of the policies after the initial rate set, after you heard from your constituents, were changed. And that's okay. We accounted for them the next time we went around. Um, but, but I just want to point out one other thing. When we did do the original rate, we did not take water consumption at 100%. We, we factored in a reduction in water use based on a sewer program. We it absolutely was in the original assumptions. It wasn't just 100% times the rate. We, we brought in a, a slight decrease. It's just we expected to continue to have um, the deduct meters made a, a much bigger decrease than we ever anticipated. Does that make sense? So, because there are industry industry standards for for the amount of Councillor Denny. Then I, I know there's two folks here at least I think want to speak. Then we have ten minutes left. So go ahead, Councillor Denny. Want to give him? Yep. The question I have is: If we go to a flat rate, will will we save money in in a sense that we will de, we will eliminate this company that we're hired, and we're not, we won't be paying the water companies to monitor our our well our uh, meters? Yes. You would certainly save some money, absolutely. The, um, the, the numbers that I've shown today are basically um, provided for residential and non-residential. So we assumed all non-residential customers would continue to be billed under the current practices as recommended in the 2018 study. Correct. But for residential folks, yes, you would save significant administration because there's no meters. monitoring of, of the meters from either water company well for, for a certain subset of the of the commercial and industrial customers you and, would and, have and a possibility maybe to the town manager or the mayor or whatever but and the possibility of eliminating a company that's billing us now that we're using to bill everyone so again you know to the idea would be to do the residential rates on flat but the commercial industrial is still based on still water. On the so there's still usage. little billing, but it would be a greatly reduced. I mean, the billing um, is not insignificant. It's a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. We can ask Mr. Wilcox to look at that for our next meeting yeah, together would, with some I would direction. Like to, I would like to see that. And also, the other thing I wanted to say, you're, you're all, all talk about the website, but material in the town in the town hall so people can come and pick it up that are that are not privy to going on a website all right we'll, we'll prepare a, uh, a a stack and we'll put it at our information desk at the uh, town hall inf at the entrance because you know i have a lot of constituents that are not on a website and they're not going to be all right fair very fair point yep thank you and you know thank what you. We'll, we'll we'll put a hundred here and we'll put a hundred at the senior center Perfect. and then if we get right. a, a request for any other location we'll put it there too Thank you very much. I'm sorry after that. We want to make sure I know there's at least two people want to speak. I want to make sure they have time. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Would you like us to hand these out or should we just leave them at the desk and 
Yeah, uh, whatever works for. Uh, so uh, we have uh, the, the, the meeting said uh, it depends how many people. I think there's two people here who want to speak, correct? So five minutes each, since you're the only two. Whoever wants to go first. Karen, five minutes. Yeah, you can stand around. Just to the. Name, name it and again specifically on a water pollution control. Thank you, Absolutely. Karen. Karen LaPlante, 166 North Maple Street. Um, okay, I've got a hand out there I'm handing out to you. And what it is, it's the three rate schedules that were included in all the public communications when we were setting these rates. The first one with the yellow was uh, the first one that for the public hearing that was set for May 7th. Um, that showed an increase of um, the the seven percent was highlighted for the uh, consumption for uh, seasonal adjustment the two dollars and five cents which w ended up being a typo down down the line um, and so forth so after the public hearing if it turned to page two um, those were the approved rate schedules. The rates were lowered from the proposed rates before the public hearing, but still resulted in a rate increase for sewer users. Page three shows the rate schedule that was adopted at the last meeting on October 15th due to a typographical error. I would like you to go back to page one and ask you, how much do you think, by looking at this schedule, do you think that the well users would be charged? Would you safely assume a residential or small non-residential user would be charged 12,380 gallons at $3.49 per thousand gallons? I'll do the math for you. It comes out to $44.60. The rate in effect at the time was 43.32. This would be approximately a 3% increase in rates reasonable for the average consumer. For the metered customers, the rate would go from 43.32 per quarter to 74.60 per quarter for the same amount of water um, when you add the proposed ready to serve fee of $30, a whopping 72% increase, which I think I pointed out during the public hearing and that was the reason for some of the changes in the rates. Um, if you notice on page one and on page two, there was never any mention of the ready to serve fixed quarterly charge for the private well-based rates. Not until we received our bills did we believe that we would be subject to the regular ready to serve fixed fee. This is well users only I'm talking about. Page three rates were adopted after your last meeting on October 15th due to a typographical error. According to Merriam-Webster's dictionary, definition of a typographical error is a mistake such as a misspelled, wor a misspelled word in typed or printed text, um, such as the book contains a number of typographical errors. On the website dictionary.com, the definition is an error in printed or typewritten matter resulting from striking an improper key of a keyboard from mechanical failure or the like. I believe it is possible that the 7% to the 7.5% might have been a typographical error. I believe the $2.05, which changed to $2.02 .02 on the second rate, and then to $2 on the third rate for the minimum delinquent fee, that could be a typographical error. But I do not agree the whole phrase, the ready to serve fixed quarterly charge for well users will be based on the smallest meter size is a typographical error. Based on this error, my rates increase from 3% to 50%. At least the metered customers can adjust their consumption to lower their rates. Well users cannot. I urge you to remove the ready to serve fee from the well users bills. Data I received from the previous town manager suggested 9,304 bills were charged the minimum of $13 from the second quarter of 2014 to the first quarter of 2015 with the increase of the minimum bill of at least 21 to at least $21 that takes into these figures assume just a $21 fee not the 3150 and upwards 
um, for the $13 minimum charge. Um, that amount would mean an additional $74,432 in revenue alone for those metered customers that were being billed the minimum $13 charge if it remained the same. Um, and that's just for 5 8 inch meters. I don't, okay. Um, there are only 308 well users. By dropping this additional $21, you are only losing $25,956 in revenue. Remember, well users can do nothing to lower their rates. Metered customers are only billed for the water they use, and so they can conserve water to lower their bills. We can't do anything. Um, also, according to some of the data I got, 15,045 customers um, are hooked up to the sewer. I have never seen data that ever showed any quarterly bill of 15,045 customers. It should always be more than that. Um, there were some at 14,000, 14,969. They're not all being billed. Or prove to me they are. Hi, I'm Jared Denardis for Center Circle. Uh, I'm a professional uh, at a wastewater treatment plant in another town, uh, so I do have some working knowledge of how a treatment plant upgrade goes, and I can understand uh, how difficult everything can be with the finances and everything going on. And I just wanted to voice my concern about the, um, I think the town manager said the the, I saw the meetings on the on the slide, and I do appreciate that. I just think, with such a large asset that the town carries, with such a large amount of money that's tied up with it, that a, a separate and finite WPCA uh, beyond just the subcommittee would benefit not only the town but the council and and everyone involved, um, because it is it is such a it is such a large and obviously it's, it's very hard to deal with and it only gets more expensive. Um, and uh, that's basically what I wanted to say. And uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, appreciate it. All right. Anyone else like to speak for the water pollution control? <coughs> oh, sorry. I'd like to speak for the water pollution control? Hearing none, thank you. Uh, I have a motion to adjourn. So moved. By Councilor F Commissioner Falk. Motion. Seconded by uh, Commissioner Denny. All those in favor by a show of hands. Opposed? <coughs> Meeting's adjourned. We have two minutes for the regular council meeting.
Okay, really? Welcome, everyone, calling the regular meeting of uh, the Enfield Town Council, Monday, November 19, 2018. Uh, prayer by Councilman Bosco. That's great, because I was hope it, it, I had it to decide, but we'll have to do it this way. Dear Lord, as we prepare for Thanksgiving this week, we pray a prayer of thankfulness. We thank you for food and remembering the hungry. We thank you for all our health and remembering the sick. We thank you for our friends and remembering the friendless. We thank you for freedom and remember the enslaved. May you bless our country, state, and town of Enfield through the holiday season and use all of us to be a blessing to others. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Councillor Bosco. Here. Councillor Sakala. Here. Councillor Grisotti. Councillor Davis. Here. Councillor Denny. Here. Councillor Falk. Here. Mayor Ludwig? Here. Councilor, Here. Councilor Muller? Here. Deputy Mayor Suzak? Here. Councilor Ungeyer? Here. Councilor Arnone? There's nine members present, two are absent. Uh, item number four, fire evacuation announcement. In case of a fire, please orderly go to the exit at the back of the, the chambers. You either go left or right, or out the doors to our left to the audience right. Go out through the first left door down the stairs and out the doors into the parking lot in case of a fire. Item number five, minutes of proceeding meetings. Since we just had a meeting on Tuesday, I'm assuming the minutes aren't ready. So there's no uh, minutes to approve. Item number six, special guests. Um, I'd like to call the chief up first, please. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Welcome. ladies and gentlemen of the council. Thank you once again for the opportunity to join you. So you, you uh, if it's uh, if it's appropriate, I can proceed with an explanation and then allow the council to uh, proceed as it sees fit. Go right ahead. Annually, the United States Attorney's Office, uh, based in New Haven, the U.S. Attorney's Office for Connecticut, recognizes those officers that have gone above and beyond the call of duty, in particular in the area of community policing. Uh, as this year's request for nominations was advanced, one officer in particular came to mind, and that's Officer Eddie Nuno, who's seated behind me, who I believe the council may wish to speak to directly in just a few moments. The request from the U.S. Attorney's Office asks for the identification of those officers who have gone the extra mile, who have taken the extra step to work within their towns and their cities to really impress upon the residents of our town and the members of the police department the value in community policing. Officer Eddie Nuno is a 25-year Enfield Police Department veteran, and as I shared with him a few moments ago, he still gets it, even after all those years. He's a veteran of the United States Coast Guard. He has served as the Enfield Police Department's representative to the town's Juvenile Review Board. He is our liaison to the Enfield Youth Services Agency. It's fair to say that his bilingual ability makes him uh, an official or unofficial ambassador to the town's Hispanic community. It is not unusual to travel through Thompsonville and see Officer Nuno interacting with members of the public. It is not unusual to see him speaking with business owners. It's not unusual to see him in the middle of a sporting event, stopping to play basketball with kids on the side of the street, um, and really impressing upon them what it means to be a good citizen, what it means to be a member of this town, and the relationship that we wish to have with the youth and the residents of our community. Uh, I have also uh, been very pleased to let you know that Officer Nuno is, uh, uh, meets regularly with assorted landlord associations, works with business owners to make sure that they do everything possible to succeed. He's been a long-term field training officer of ours uh, that allows him to pass his skills on to the next generation. 
it's the totality of these attributes that caused me uh, immediately to recognize and recommend Officer Nuno for this recognition. I'm very pleased to tell you that Officer Nuno was one of a handful of officers that were accepted and that were recognized by the U.S. Attorney's Office last month in this regard. Over the nine months that I have been with you, I have learned the skill set, uh, slowly but surely, of the officers that I am honored to work with. And they have different skill sets, and there are different times where I need those different officers. Officer Nuno consistently demonstrates the best of what EPD has to offer, and I'm very pleased to be able to bring him with me this evening for recognition by the town council. Thank you very much, sir. And Mr. Mayor, I'd like to say when the chief brought this to our attention and sent it and shared it with me as he, he does when officers are recognized, I sent it to council and, and you all immediately said, bring him here so the entire town can join in this and celebrate and thank him. And I will tell you, I've known Officer Nuno for many, many, many years, all of my years here. And I have to tell you, as manager, it's heartening. In addition to everything the chief said is more people than you can know tell me in the street or Thompsonville or in town hall, we love Officer Nuno, and that's an accomplishment in today's times. So without further ado. You guys want to come? If you want, to you. Mr. Mayor, he's joined by his wife this evening, Laura Jean. First of all, Chief, great, great introdu introduction. Proclamation honoring Community Policing Award recipient Officer Eddie G. Nuno. Whereas the United States Attorney's Office for the District of Connecticut recognizes Officer Eddie Nuno among 14 other law enforcement officers and community members from cities and towns across the state at a Community Policing Award ceremony on October 30th, 2018. And whereas in honoring the very best in community policing in Connecticut, U.S. Attorney, U.S. Attorney John H. Durham stated that these deserving law enforcement officers understand that community policing is an effective way to prevent crime, solve neighborhood problems, keep our cities and towns safe and secure. And they know that it is critically important to engage with members of the community in positive and friendly, constructive ways long before a call for service. And whereas Officer Eddie Nuno is a 25-year veteran of the Enfield Police Department, after serving with the United States Coast Guard, he has worked in a variety of capacities over the course of, the, of his Enfield Police Department career. And whereas the Enf Enfield is very fortunate that the officer, that in that Officer Nuno serves as a field training officer, placing him in a position to pass on the skills and a positive mindset that he possesses to the next generation of Enfield Police Officers. And whereas Officer Nuno serves as the Enfield Police Department's representative to the town's Juvenile Review Board, as well as department's liaison to the Enfield Youth Services Agency, and whereas Officer Nuno is well known, particularly in the Townsville section of town, for his regular community interactions, stopping to visit with community youth, meeting with landlord associations, helping businesses do everything possible to succeed. Now, therefore, I, Michael Ludwig, Mayor of the Town of Enfield, on behalf of the Town Council, the Town Administration, the entire community, do hereby congratulate Officer Eddie G. Nuno on receiving a Connecticut U.S. Attorney's Office Community Policing Award as one of the most conscientious and committed officers in service today with a true dedication to the concept of community policing. Congratulations, sir. Well, I guess the, uh, the glory to this award uh, does not go to me. It goes to our, our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, without him, there's uh, nothing good comes with, without God. Uh, so I would, uh, the glory goes to him for this award. Uh, second of all, I'd like to thank Chief, uh, Chief Fox for uh, putting us in for, putting me in for this award and, and the town council for your support and uh, Mr. Mayor, Ms. Uh, Deputy Mayor, your, your support as well. Uh, Mr. Bromson as well, yours, sir. And uh, I'd like to also thank uh, my wife who's been putting up with me for 25 years. A uh, lot has gone on in this line of work a lot of sacrifices. Unfortunately, my wife uh, has taken the brunt of the sacrifice. Uh, and so a lot of this award goes to my wife. Uh, that's who I would award this to if I had to give it to somebody. So I thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Keep up the good work. Thank Keep you. up the good work. Thank you very much. Thank good you. job. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you. So, well, before, I think Randy probably should have the same, right? Do you, Randy, do you want to be yes. able to have a little bit? Next item. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Would you like to give a little? Thank you, sir. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you. Thanks, Joe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good evening. My name is Randy Daigle. And, uh... Good evening. My name is Randy <laughs> Daigle. Um, every time I've spoken and I was part of this organization that I'm going to be talking about, I've always said I've been fortunate enough to be the chairman of this building committee. And I truly take that at heart. Um, there's an old saying that nobody knows everything, but you surround yourself with a team that, and together we do. Um, I was fortunate enough to have Wendy Sato as my vice chair and panel members, committee members um, that supported and followed through with their obligation to this town. Um, some of us have been doing it for over seven years now for just this project alone. Um, it was a diverse amount of people, um, some in construction, some without, some parents, um, some business owners. But the one thing that we did, we respected everybody's opinion. Um, me in the construction field, I see things a little bit different than somebody in a business field or somebody that's a, that's a, that's a parent. Um, so we were, I was very, very fortunate um, to have a, such a unique building panel um, members. And at, one, at no point did any of them make a decision based on politics. There was never a Republican decision or Democrat decision. It was what was first, what was right for the kids, what was the, right for the taxpayers, and what was successful for the project. Um, and I just commend everybody that was on this committee and the liaisons. Um, a lot of them weren't here from the beginning, but those that were uh, chosen, uh, they volunteered to be liaisons. Um, they showed up and they, they were at the meetings and the information that they were able to bring back to allow you guys to support our decisions was second to none. So I appreciate it very much. Um, I don't know if Wendy wanted to. I just have one thing to add. Wendy Osada, 8 Windmill Road. Um, and it has also been my honor to serve as the vice chairman um, for this committee. And then don't forget, more than seven years ago, because pre-ref was before that, wasn't it? Right. Yeah. OK, so it's been longer than that. Um, and I just wanted to say, um, echo everything that Randy said. We were a very diverse bunch of people. I did not know the first thing about construction when I started in with this. I've learned a lot since then, no, by no means an expert. But um, this entire town owes a debt of gratitude to Randy, because I can tell you right now, without Randy Andy Daigle, as the chairman of this committee, we would not have finished, you know, ahead of schedule, under budget, and with the product that we did. So you're just, we're just extremely lucky to have had Randy, um, and that he was willing to serve in this capacity for us. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you both. Okay. Thank you. Folks, want to come? So you want to? Yeah. Let's call the names and let's get everybody. You guys want to shake their hands? Congratulations. Okay. So we, so we have a little just a token of our if, uh, folks from the building committee would mind coming up. We'll call you up or, or we'll do it one by one. Yeah. All right. We have a little appreciation uh, token of our appreciation. We have certificate of appreciations um, signed by the deputy mayor and myself for all the, f the good folks who worked on the uh, building committee. First person. Uh, Miss Virginia Austin. Uh, Mr. Jason Kilty. Thank you, Virginia. Oh, Jason. Yeah. Uh, we'll we hold. Get a yeah, we'll get it. Jason Kilty. Not here. He's so. Not here, but I'll see that he gets it tomorrow morning. Uh, Mr. Walter Krizel.
Did you get? Did you get two? Yeah. You got two, two. there. <laughs> you know, Walter started off as a, a committee member, and then he ran for the board of education, and he now sits as the chair and the liaison. Walter, how many notebooks do you have? <laughs> he ran every penny, this every thing, financial. This thing is warm, so. Yeah. So. So Walter, special thank you and recognition of being a member and then going on to the Board of Education. Well, on behalf of the board, I want to thank these guys, especially Randy, Wendy, and the rest of you, because you guys did all the work. I was just standing there filling notebooks, that's all. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we were going in alphabetical order. Randy Daigle. <laughs> Okay, so Randy, Randy's been on a number of building committees. I've known Randy since the mid-1990s. He's uh, known to get it done, although someone time has to go behind him and clean up the mess. <laughs> Good work. Thanks, Randy. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Doug McSellen. Again, Doug's another one of our people that served on a number of building committees. I've met Doug in the 1990s. He's done the fire um, building committees uh, for their additions to North Thompsonville, and he's helped the town out on the elementary and the high school. So we have a lot of repeat people who have done a lot of work here in the town of Enfield. Thanks, Doug. And he sits on facilities, too. <laughs> Thank you. There's another person, Joe Muller. Joe, and Joe's another one of our people that, you know, started out on the building committee and ended up on town council. So, and he works at S. Nantuck, and uh, he has a big asset to all our building committee and our building projects. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Okay, Jim Nasuda can't uh, make it tonight, but I will see that he does get his certificate of appreciation. Wendy? Wendy, Wendy Osada. She's such a ball of energy. <laughs> Thanks, Wendy. George Stretch? George Gregg? <laughs> Sorry, Greg. Well, you know, when you get in as much trouble as you do, it's good to have an alias. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. Thank you. I look forward to working with you on other committees. Gina Sullivan. Thank you. Gina, Thank you. great job on the web page and all the communication that you worked on with, it was Wendy and with um, Laura Vella. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Laura Vella. Thank you. Laura. Great job. Thank you so much. We have two people that won't be here. They could not make the meeting, but I'd like them to get some recognition. And that was George Rippish, who started out as a building committee member and stepped up to do programming when Art um, left. And Lynn Skull, who was our secretary and um, our conscience at times. So, but everybody's worked really hard. And uh, I don't know, it'd be nice for the home audience if they would just all come and make a one you can make one more. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, there's one person that's been with um, Wendy and I for over seven years. And uh, even though she's not a volunteer, but she, she has been there for, she's the one that's been at most meetings out of all of us. Uh, I just want to acknowledge Ellen Smith for everything you've done for us. Thank you. Does anybody else want to say anything? All set? You want to get a picture of? 
Yeah, we're going to move back. And and we're going to give recognition to Tim Neville, who was our liaison from the Board of Ed. Uh, all set with special item number seven, public communications. Would anyone like to speak for the council at this time? Walter Cruzel, 21 Charney Road. Simple. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else like to speak for it? It's tough to follow. Anyone else like to speak on public communications? <laughs> Hearing none, uh, declare public communication closed. Item number eight, councilor communications. Would anyone like else, would it account, does that councilor have anything? Yes. Yeah, do we have a, councilor Muller? Real quick, I served on the building committee with everyone and it was a true honor to be on the committee. And all that wouldn't have been possible without Randy and Wendy. Thank you and everyone else. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Council on Guy. I want to thank the building committee for all their hard work, and thanks for coming here tonight. Um, I wanted to announce about the Wreaths Across America ceremony, which is going to be Saturday, December 15th at 12 noon. It will be held at St. Patrick's Cemetery in King Street in Enfield. And this ceremony will be simultaneously with the same ceremony in Arlington to honor, honor our local heroes. And if you'd like to RSVP, you can to Vinnie Grady at vinniegrady at cox.net. And if you'd like to purchase a wreath, you can go on the web with wreathsacrossamerica.org. Also, first readers had their ceremony, and they awarded all the certificates uh, to the kids. It's, uh, it's a really a, a fun event, and it's very rewarding. Uh, their next ceremony will be March 11th. Also, they're going to be having their trivia night. Uh, it's their one big fundraiser of the year, and that will be February 23rd. And I'd like to wish everyone a very happy Thanksgiving. Thank Mayor Suzak. I'd like to make a motion to suspend the rules and move items E, F, G, H to miscellaneous and proceed to vote. Second. Motion by Deputy Mayor Suzak, seconded by Councillor Denny. Any discussion on a motion to suspend the rules and move the miscellaneous? Hearing none, by a show of hands, all those in favor? Those opposed, everyone's in favor and zero against. Anything else for council communications? The only thing I'd just like to add is that uh, I know we're here, but um, tonight was the football team are back in almost Thanksgiving Day football was tonight at, at Enfield High, which the game I think kicked off at six, even though we're missing it. But again, good news is that we now have almost Thanksgiving football back in the town of Enfield. So hopefully they're winning and um, Again, it'd be nice to kind of beat South Windsor. Uh, not a big fan, but uh, yeah, that'd be nice. So that's that's it. And the only other thing, too, last thing, uh, the, the snow was real heavy on Wednesday. It seems like a while ago. And I know, again, I see it all the time, pe neighbors helping neighbors out with snow blowers. It was a real heavy snow. Again, nominate those neighbors who help you out. We want to honor those folks. Now, the same people who helped you with the leaves. Again, I know this was a very heavy snow, and it's tough for some people to be able to move that snow if they don't have a snowblower. So nominate that neighbor who helped you out during this storm. Uh, item number nine, Tom Andrew. I have no formal report. I am available to answer any questions on the PAR. Any, question, any questions for the manager? Councilor Muller? Is there an update on the light poles on Palumba? There was three there. 
I know we had an update we passed on from Director Nunes uh, why there had been a slight delay, I think, in ordering. Well, I can get an update okay. for it forward to you uh, tomorrow. Thank you. Any other questions for the town, town manager? Chris, I had one quick question. I'm sorry, I'm trying to find it in a par. I was on the uh, what, social services come here December 3rd meeting. Excuse me? Folks from the so, well, for a special guest, it'll be social services. I don't have the agenda in front of me. I know, I, I believe we have them slated okay, to come. I'm trying to find it in a par, sorry. I'm trying to, I, between last week and this yeah. week. Oh, uh, so my question is, so can we make sure if we're going to have the, whenever they're on the agenda for, that um, we can hand out the infill cares? We've gotten, so we've gotten some questions on if people want to voluntarily sign up, you know, to, if there's an emergency yep. we have. I know we've got some questions and I know Don. All right, so you, you've yeah. reminded me. What, what we were going to do, I believe there are special guests continuing with, you know, right. education and, and, and presenting different programs. I believe we're all, we're, I don't have Donald Noons here any longer this evening, but we're going to be doing a presentation on the snow removal. And I would just say, you know, it wasn't a major nor'easter, uh, but it was challenging in its own way. Uh, and I think Public Works, they did a very good job uh, for us, unlike New York City. So I guess it isn't as simple as it looks. Um, and they kept up, me updated, and I was able to keep the council updated. So I was appreciative of that. Um, and what we'll do, they'll be here for that, to give a special presentation. And uh, social services, Dawn has headed up a, a group for me in regard to updating you on our shelter provisions. Right. So that what we're going to be doing, and part of that is Enfield Cares, it's it's about two or three parts to it. One is where we can have people sign up with special needs. We're going to do uh, that and uh, through the police department so they know when, if a storm event occurs, what to check on people and be able to check in with them. Um, and she updated it. It's a really nice uh, um, program that she's proposing. And then we'll be talking about the Enfield Shelter so people know where it is, um, how it's activated, how we'll communicate it, uh, what they should should bring what they shouldn't bring so in the event there is a snow event or some other power outage where we have to activate the shelter it'll be a primer for individuals to know um, at least the ABC's and where they can look in advance we've been out there we've marked it we have um, staff shirting we have wristbands for people who come so we, we really wanted to make sure if hopefully we're prepared we won't need it that's what my mom always said so uh they've done a really good job on it and she'll be here Perfect. next meeting it's a great program i know we've been asked about it and maybe to counselor denny's point early but earlier instead of on the website we put some handouts for at the senior center for folks who don't have access she has a, she has a whole Perfect. proposal right because it's a great program that's it any other questions for the town manager uh item number 10 town attorney report Good evening, everyone. I don't have a formal report, uh, but I know that the property maintenance slash motor vehicle is on later in the agenda. So if you'd like to hear about it later, I can address it then. Well, it won't, it won't come off the table, right, this meeting? What we were going to do, uh, our uh, plan was um, the council had asked that she have a, a, a workable draft for today. So you can take it on or, or, or off the table as you deem appropriate. We went to development services last Friday. They approved uh, the draft. We sent it to the council over the weekend. So if council has questions, we could take it off the table. If not, what our proposal is now that I think we've addressed all the public concerns, council concerns, and we have a viable document that we would then proceed for the first meeting in December to actually put it on for the public hearing and for adoption so, so it, it's up to you we'll, we'll remove it from the table if anyone has any specific questions so we do this legally okay all right okay so we'll reach it then yep. take it off if there's questions you yep. we can because what we want to avoid is not answering any questions having you look at it between now and that next meeting and then having us have to go back and and re-notice a public hearing and do it again so we're trying to do it right. in a um and maybe if we take it off the table some of your ideas around how we're going to handle this Yes, okay. the enforcement part of it. Okay, so we'll, right. we'll make a motion to move okay. from the table. Yep, perfect. Thank you. Any other questions for the town attorney? Not tonight. Thank you, Maria. No. Item uh, 11, report of special committees of the council. Uh, Councilor Falk. Uh, development services met last week, and uh, as the manager just said, we talked about the, um, the blight ordinance and the, the, the associated with the automobile ordinance. Um, and uh, I think a copy was emailed out to all the council people, so you all have it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would hope that we would have a discussion about it tonight. You're going to take it off the table. We'll talk about it because there's some changes that we made, and uh, others may have some additional changes they would like to make. 
Uh, we also talk a little bit about the TIF. Uh, we're st still moving forward with uh, preliminary um, type uh, policy or f for specific TIF zones. I know uh, we talked about Thompsonville, the possibility of setting a TIF in, in other areas of town, such as Hazardville or Skidiko. But uh, right now, we need to, to draft one to get accustomed to what it should say and how it should be set up uh, so we can move forward with that. And um, town attorney has also been working on, I think it's the town attorney, or, or maybe it was the planning department, the tax abatement policy. That was yours, right? <laughs> we, we, we had uh, drafted a policy for tax abatement uh, merely as guidelines, and I, and I brought that up because of the fact that uh, we typically, as a council, would address those on a, a per-case uh, basis, but the average Joe or average business out in town doesn't even know the policy exists. So I suggested that we had some guidelines available somewhere on the town website or elsewhere so that these people would know that the program exists so that they could at least ask or inquire or apply for it, and then we could consider their specific uh, needs at that time. So uh, that was in, in up for discussion, and, and we'll have more discussion on that at a future date. Thank you. Councilor Danny. Public Works. Want to say anything? Uh, well, the NOVAC, we went over the NOVAC uh, uh, report. Uh, it's going to be tweaked. Uh, we talked to the people at Public Works. They have some issues with people that they might not need that the NOVAC represented. Uh, I, I think we're going in the right direction with it. Uh, we're talk there was talk about uh, an extra vehicle uh, because of PM, uh, and they're looking, and we're looking into uh, purchasing a used trash truck. So. Uh, <clears throat> they're talking about uh, no night shifts and so forth and so on at Public Works. Um, I guess that basically, Donna, well, you got well, mainly, else? I miss something. Percentage of trash. Really have to, I think they're so going to. Okay, go ahead. Yep, sorry, go ahead. Um, I'm going to. Just want to make sure he was done yeah. on the floor. Go ahead. Ed's yeah. looking for us yeah. to, to throw in a few comments, and I guess the fact that we need to be really conscientious about our recycle. Recycle costs us $10 a ton. Trash costs us $70 a ton. A $60 differential is huge. And we have to be really conscientious about what we do. And we looked at um, higher tipper fees. And we also looked at um, maybe limiting how much people can throw away as trash. You know, you get one can and you got to close the lid. So we're really looking at how do we do this better? How do other um, people who provide trash, how do they function and how do they get, you know, the people who use their services to be reasonable about their use? And we're also looking well, at sure. higher tipper fees at the dump, at the transfer station. So I thought it was a really good representation of the NOVAC report. I thought our staff did a great job of looking at everything. And you know, putting a spin on it that this is this could work in Enfield, and maybe with a little bit of um, tweaking, it could work a little better in Enfield. Councilor Bosco. Ultimately, we uh, took the whole public works and we turned it all upside down, and we're starting fresh. Uh, we're going to make all new ordinances for trash to make it as efficient as possibly. Um, we looked at how our garage runs to make that run as efficiently as possible. So we're, 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 we have a big task. It was over a two hour meeting and we looked at everything in DPW and um, we're just gonna restructure everything, including water pollution control. We looked at all that and it's all gonna be done to, to get our biggest bang for our buck and to get the most out of what we have and to be able to offer the best services to the residents of Enfield at the lowest cost as possible. And the only way we could do it is to look at it completely new with fresh eyes, and, and that's what the committee did. So uh, we got a lot of work in front of us, and but we're gonna, when we get done, it should work out better, and uh, some people aren't gonna be happy. Other ones are gonna be tickled, but we, it's, it's survival mode right now, and we need to keep things as tight as possible because we can't afford any more tax increases. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah. Councilor Ungar. Uh, I'd like to say I've been attending the meetings with the Enfield Together Coalition, uh, and they're working with youth services 
Um, Enfield Together Coalition is working for a drug-free community, and right now our focus has turned to the faith-based community, and we think that's really an untapped resource. And so we've had meetings where we've invited a representative or a leader of all the churches in the town of Enfield, and it's it's been very successful. We've had several meetings. Um, the attendance is strong. The interest is strong. And so we're working on uh, prevention with our young people. That seems to be the key. So I'll keep you posted on uh, what our updates are and how it's progressing. Great. Anyone else? And I'll just say again, this is all both parties, all, everyone on the council. This is their personal time, and they've done a great. Everyone's done a great job going to the subcommittees. We've gotten a lot of work done and started, which puts us in a much better place going into the budget next year. No matter what happens with our funding from the state, I mean, I, again, the, the members of both parties in the council are taking time out of their day and their work schedule. These are things during the day, and so again, I, rec I commend every, and of course, the staff as well for being willing to get down and do some work. This is a, just another piece of work that you know, get, both parties are doing to kind of, again, prepare and to try to, to Councillor Moscow's point, to provide the best service at the lowest cost. So again, I, th I commend everybody, because I know it takes time out of your work schedules and your personal schedules. So again, thank you. Uh, item number 12, old business. Um, item A, appointments one through three, we have none. On page two, appointments, town council, items four through 17, we have none. Page three, town council appointments, item 18 and 19, again, we have none. On page three, item B, appointments, town manager, uh, items one through 12, we have none. Items 13 and 14, again, we have none. Item C, discussion resolution to adopt amendments to the Enfield Town Code, chapter 38, article five. Sections 38 141 through 38 145 inclusive. Do I have a motion to remove the table? Mm -hmm. By Councillor Falk, yeah. seconded by Councillor Denny. All those in favor of removing from the table by a show of hands. Those opposed? Any abstentions? All in favor? Zero against? No abstentions? So this is the uh, town attorney, uh, Maria, this is the amendment to the, the, I guess, the car ordinance, for lack of a better word, that we've, we, we had a meeting, I think, a month and a half ago. And this is sort of what we talked about a little bit with the town attorney report. So I will, if you want to give a brief update, you I'd met, be happy I know the uh, department, the uh, subcommittee department of uh, uh, development services met. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Okay, just to kind of go back in time briefly on October 1st, you had a public hearing. Is it on? Uh, on October 1st, you had a public hearing. It came to light that the few suggestions that were made by the enforcement officer who at the time was Sergeant Meyer were just, I guess, the beginning of some of the changes that maybe needed to be made. The public was heard. The council had some input. So in the aftermath of that, we were directed to look at making some of the following changes. And just bear with me. Some of this is a little bit detailed, but I just want to set the stage for why what you had in front of you over the weekend did not mirror what was discussed in the aftermath of that October 1st meeting. So people talked about the unmanageable title. They were concerned about the definitions of inoperable and un unregistered and unsightly. Uh, the discussion around deleting registration was brought up because the real issue was junk cars. There were concerns about whether or not then you would be able to get the tax money. There's still an obligation to have taxes paid. Uh, one of the residents uh, noticed that the unsightly material section was really redundant to have it in that section since property maintenance already had jurisdiction. There were some concerns about possibly including a permitting requirement. There was an interest in having more enforcement of motor vehicles be like property maintenance so that it would be removed from the police and be brought over to property maintenance. There was also concern around including something like a blight review committee, and that, that phrase has come up a number of times, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on that right now because that's going to be something for the council a little bit further down the line. So we met with the town manager and his staff. We discussed all those changes. We were directed to make some of them. The Development Services Committee, this was in the October 9th meeting, totally thought that that was a good idea as well. So we went about to make those changes. We revised the existing abandoned, unsightly motor vehicles ordinance. When we sent that around in early November for staff comment, we got back a really good idea that was quite simple, but did not necessarily address all the other issues that I just mentioned. The suggestion was, since this is about 
really dealing with junk cars, why not, instead of having these two freestanding ordinances, one having to do with motor vehicles, one having to do with property maintenance, which you typically refer to as blight, and we'd still have to address blight review, which is nowhere yet. So if you were to include blight review within motor vehicles, you'd have to ultimately amend property maintenance anyway. So the suggestion was, rather than doing anything with motor vehicles, why don't you just put motor vehicles into property maintenance and repeal motor vehicles? So it simplifies a lot, since the enforcement was to mirror property maintenance. And, and what was happening is, as often is the case, when these ordinances get done in a piecemeal fashion, you know, over the course of 5, 10, 20 years, they, they're trying to do the same things, but they have different drafters. They don't really look the same. It makes it very confusing. So once the suggestion was made, and that too was brought to the manager and to development services, and there seemed to be some support for that. There were also changes recommended by enforcement personnel, and those changes are reflected in the draft that was sent to you over the weekend, and the draft that was sent was really revising property maintenance. Um, the other suggestions that were beyond the scope of mirroring property maintenance were just tweaking some of the things that enforcement personnel have had an issue with, and they're very early on, things <coughs> like some of the blight <coughs> definitions, they're in red expanding the, for example, the area of exterior wall rather than being 25 percent to having it be 50 percent. And these are just things that the enforcement um, inspectors have seen come up repeatedly. So they, we inserted um, definitions that were related to motor vehicle that we had had in the motor vehicle ordinance. And we also added the blight review. So in response to the draft that was sent this weekend, we did get a couple of comments back from the deputy mayor, uh, and, and they were related to some of the language in motor vehicle and also clarifying the area where there is an exemption. And one of the things that the councils through the years have always been consistent about is if someone is buying a property and wants, it to, wants to remediate it, they shouldn't be punished or if it's something where um, they're going to require a special permit, then to have a fine be accruing while they're trying to remedy things by either getting a special permit or a building permit is just patently unfair. So the language related to uh, special permit and excuse me, exceptions is in 14185. And so that's been just clarified. There's nothing substantively different about that. It's just clear that if you, if you have that need to get a permit or if you're a bona fide purchaser, you get this additional 30 days. And since it was originally it just said 30 days, it's not really realistic to expect to be able to get your permit and everything wrapped up within 30 days. So then you would have another 30 after that. It's just clear that you went ahead to get, to, you've gone through the process and you're trying to get the permit. And for those um, kinds of violations that don't require a permit, something that just requires lawn mowing, you just get your 30 days and that's it. So I don't know if you have any specific questions about this one. Um, to the extent that some of the concerns of the motor vehicle ordinance were not addressed in here, it was, the, and I'll let the town manager speak to it, but he felt that you could at least, um, some of those things can be addressed in other venues later on. But in terms of just streamlining the process and moving this ahead without a lot of difficulty, this might be the way to go. So if you have any questions, just let me know. No, I would just like to thank um, the town attorney's office and all of the people from development services, the committee, and all of our, our staff and our blight officers. This was a lot of work. It seems easy, it's not, because when you do one thing, it opens up something else. It's like opening a Pandora's box. But I think as it evolved, it, it seemed, we've always, we talk about consolidation. Let's streamline things. Let's make them simpler for people to understand. This accomplishes that. I would. Uh, add what Peter said at, at the subcommittee meeting. It's never going to be perfect, but we've got to start someplace. I think this is a heck of a good start. And two of the most important things that it addressed, two of the most important concerns I think council had and even residents, for it to have teeth 
and the previous give a ticket, give a ticket, walk away wasn't giving it teeth. Two, police are very busy doing other law enforcement things, and we really shouldn't be taxing them with this responsibility when we get a, a lot of different officers who are new going out there who've never done it before, so you get inconsistencies, and the public gets a perception they're not interested in doing it. It's not that, but they want to be doing police work, so we're taking it away, giving it to Blight where it should be, uh, and also the Blight Review Committee. This gives us an opportunity to, to put this together, and after the administrative is done and people have nowhere else to go, they then, according to what we've sent to you, and you can fine-tune it, they can come and plead their case of hardship for whatever reason, um, illness, handicap, whatever it is, to the council, and you can be a court of last resort for them. So I think it accomplishes a lot. Um, it's not perfect. I like the saying, don't let the, uh, you know, perfect be the enemy of the good. This is pretty darn good. Um, we have time now for you to look at it. And we can receive any other input because, as Suzanne says, we can't put it on for the first meeting for the public hearing. Next meeting, we would set the public hearing. So we still have that window to get some input from you. Again, we've left some things out, but be not afraid. We're going to reconvene. I, I'm going to tell you truthfully, we sort of took a hiatus from the blighted properties, our top 10. We were really focusing in like a laser. I want to get back to that for a little bit. Once we pass this, then we'll come back and deal with the commercial aspects. Uh, you know, uh, we have said that with, you know, uh, unregistered, maybe from a zoning perspective, to, to use the best tools uh, to address the those other issues, um, wreckers and other commercial things that Joey has addressed. But this is really, really good, and I, I um, su support it and I recommend it. Lastly, if you are inclined to do it, as I've told you, we'll, we'll have all the um, resolutions ready um, because as of January 1st, we can change the funds. There's one position um, that we had funded. We have about $94,000 in it. I don't think it's an effective position. We haven't been able to fill it, so I've cannibalized it. I've chopped it up into four positions. A new blight officer, because as I've said before, and it bears repeating, to give this work to blight and double their workload, not give them the personnel, we're doomed to disaster. Uh, two, our ZEO has gotten his... Uh, um, credentials and some of the certificates you need. We really have a need to have a full-time ZEO money we can allocate there. Um, thirdly, I do want a safety officer to help us with OSHA enforcement and doing accident investigations across the town. We have the money for that. And then lastly, we still have enough in the pie. Um, as I've said, we've had difficulty getting hearing officers. It's terrible to run the whole football game and then fumble right when you're about to make the touchdown. And that's what we have now with hearing officers. It's very technical what we have to do to make sure we've complied with the statutes, giving notice to people, giving them the right to hearing. We've had people over the years who have volunteered, quite frankly, it's like the old gray mayor. They're just too tired to do it, and they're not getting compensated. Some of them were you know, local lawyers who did it as a volunteer, but they were actually losing money because they're, they're paying their secretaries. It'll be a modicum. We'll open it up. There's nobody pre-designed. We'll let people apply. They just have to be able to do it, um, and we'll do a stipend to do the hearings under these ordinances. So now we know at the end we will get it over and across the finish line. So I think it's a heck of a package, um, and I hope that you'll uh, fa move favorably on it. We can, again, wait till the next meeting for any other comment. We could try to incorporate them or discuss it with you, but otherwise we'll set the public hearing and do it in December. And again, this is another promise kept by the council and by staff. We looked at this, and you know what? We could have rushed it. We could have just done a couple of little changes, Scribner changes that, you know, would have, okay, we did it, uh, the case law, the police. We didn't do that. We, we really looked at this, and we dug in, and we made sure that we did the hard work to come up with a product that would, be, would help our neighborhoods, would address the situation, would give it teeth, and I think it's a model ordinance when all is said and done. I just wanted to thank uh, Maria and, and Chris for a great job, plus all the, uh, the backup staff that supported you in, in putting this together. Uh, and as I mentioned at the meeting Friday, uh, th there's no perfect document that's going to cover everything. Uh, so we could consider this like a, a living document. You, you approve something, give it a shot, and if you have problems, you can change it. But you you got to move forward and you got to start somewhere, and, and this is a good start, and, and I'm totally in favor of it. Thank you. Council Bosco. I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but farms stay the same? Actually, they were included as an exemption. Okay. And uh, we'll go over we'll get, uh, the other stuff. So what happens in the meantime now? We don't, we don't enforce what, what we haven't finished up on the commercial side? 
I'm not sure I'm following you. Well, is, is that is the old ordinance? It's still in effect. Stay in effect. It's still that in effect. Right. Everything, right. Is, everything so is everything is status else stays quo. Everything the same except for the stuff we changed. Right. Okay. Good. Any other questions? I think setting up this should be on the agenda. Well, I know we'll talk about it, but yes, setting a public hearing. And again, I and I know Marie and your staff took a lot of time doing this, and I and again it gets. Councilor Bosco's long waited light board, you know, again, an appeal process, which I think some members of the community actually mentioned at the public hearing. Yeah, I mean, I think so. To your point, nothing's perfect, but give you credit for listening to the individuals who came to that meeting, who, again, rightfully have been frustrated over the years that we've sort of, I don't want to use the word we didn't enforce it, but maybe whatever. Oh, you leave the word whatever there and, and call it and leave it at that. But I also agree with you, it shouldn't be a police matter. It makes complete sense to move it into zoning where it belongs. Let the police do their job, you know, and uh, you know, let us, you know, enforce the zoning laws. So I think it's I think it's a great step, and I I read through it quickly, so I'm sure I'll have questions. But I I appreciate the fact that I know you put a lot of time into it, Deputy Mayor Suzak. Now, will that be out on the web for people to read before we schedule yes, the public hearing? Yes, that's the one hearing? thing I failed to say. We wanted also for the public to to have to be able to look at it after you uh, and Development Services gave your imprimatur to it, because that way, by the next meeting, before you set the if there's a lot of other changes, then we'll we'll push it a little bit so that we don't want to do this again. We want to do it in one fell swoop. So we're going to put it on the website, and if we get feedback for the next meeting, it's certainly going to come to you. We'll make it to your attention. Staff will review it to say we agree with this, we don't. You'll make the final decision to the language, and then we can set the public hearing that night. Perfect. Thank you, they Deputy did, Mayor. They really did do a great job. It's yeah. really a great... Um, and also it gives rights to people that are in adjacent properties because sometimes it might not be visible from the street, but it certainly is not slightly. Do we have a motion to move back on the table? Make a motion. Councillor Bosco, second. seconded by Councillor Denny. All those in favor, keep it on the table. Any opposed? All in favor, zero against. So we're good. Item 13, new business. We have none on the consent agenda. Appointment B item B we do not have that's not ready right that's not in our packet item C no appoints for the town manager no and item D no planning and zoning appointments uh, commission appointments council approved uh, item 14 item items for discussion discussion item A we don't have any consent agenda item B appointments by the town council we have none item C appointments by the town manager again none item D P and Z commission approved council approved appointed council approved we have none. Items E, F, G, and H have been moved to miscellaneous. So we move to item 15, miscellaneous, and we have item E. Request for transfer funds for police services stipends. Sorry, one second, I will get there. Okay, so this is... Resolve that in accordance with Chapter 6, Section 8F of the Town Charter, the following transfers hereby made. Two police services from overtime, 1-200500-514000 of 11,700 from general fund revenue, grants other state, grants other state 1004 000 of 11,700. Certified the funds are available on November 9, 2018 by John Wilcox, our Director of Finance, approved by the Town Manager, Chris Bronson on 11-14-2018. So moved. By Councilor Falk, seconded by Deputy Mayor Suzak. And this is just simply this for the click, ticket, and, click, and ticket. click it or ticket. It's 100% reimbursed. It's a grant, and there's no budget impact. We do this twice a year. They want to be able to do this in November and December. Yeah. I'm assuming no questions on this. Hearing none, roll call, please. Councillor Bosco. Four. Councillor Sakala. Four. Councillor Denny. Four. Councillor Falk. Four. Mayor Ludwig. Four. Councillor Muller. Four. Deputy Mayor Suzak. Four. Councillor Ungeyer. Four. Say it in favor, none against, and no abstentions. Item F. I'm sorry, one second. Uh, discussion resolution for transfer of funds for EMS per personnel of $100,804. Resolve in the courts of Chapter 6, Section 8F of the Town Charter. The following transfers hereby made. From account 1080092-584-000 of $100,804, unallocated charges contingency. From account 2524-0000-48001 of $100,804, EMS 
Revenue General Fund Transfers to account 1080092 593035 of 100,804. Unallocated transfer to EMS to account 252220000-511000-60934 EMS salaries account 252220000-521000-35076 EMS health medical insurance to account 252220000-521500 of $132 EMS life insurance again to account 252220000-522000 of $3,778 EMS Social Security and to account 2522000-522100 of $884 to EMS Medicare. Certified that the funds are available on November 15, 2018 by John Wilcox, our Director of Finance. Approved by Chris Bronson, Town Manager on 11-15-2018. By Councilor Sakala, Second. seconded by Councilor Denny. Discussion on a resolution. Uh, Councilor Bosco. I'm going to I'm not going to support this. I'm going to vote against it. I don't have a problem giving them the money and, and the extra help they need, but I would like to uh, first go the avenue and talk to the fire departments. You know, they, they may be able to do something to alleviate part of our problem, which wouldn't cost the taxpayers any more money. Um, if that failed, then I really don't have a problem with, with issuing the uh, the extra money, but I think that we owe it to the taxpayers to at least go to the fire department first and see if they'll work with us. And if we can't, then I have no problem. But I'm going to be a no vote for that reason. Councillor Falk, then Councillor Denny. <clears throat> uh, I, I'm going to support it only because it's a it's a public safety need, and uh, <clears throat> I, I believe the uh, the staffing level should be at 22, and I think we're at 19. And uh, the uh, people that are there are working uh, extremely a lot of overtime and they're getting burnt out and frustrated. Um, so I'll, I'll support it, but I, I do want to follow up on uh, Joey's comment about the fire department. That's an untapped resource that we have. We have uh, five fire districts in town, uh, five, six firehouses in town, so randomly strategically placed all over town. And I think if you were fully staffed, the most you're going to put out is four ambulances on first shift. And you have a total of seven ambulances that are sitting there doing nothing. Those could be at a firehouse somewhere, and those firemen could be driving them to the scene. And they could also be driving. I, they wouldn't have any paramedics, but they do have EMTs, and they could support the paramedics of the town uh, while maybe driving the ambulance to the hospital instead of send, st sending one of the EMTs or paramedics to drive to the hospital. You could have a fireman drive to the hospital. So there's some potential there to get them involved, and I would hope that we would start having some discussion with them about possibly helping out and getting involved in the EMS program. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Denny. Well, I'm going to support this because right now I don't want to delay it any longer, and maybe the fire department is a good idea, but we already had a res another resignation, and we're not able to uh, put four ambulances on, a, on the road during the day. We're lucky we're having three. Sometimes we're having two. Uh, lately, we've had uh, ambulances from out of town and also from Hartford. So if you're laying on your floor, uh, to me, it's a public safety thing, and I'm supporting it. Thank you. Councilor Angar. Um, I'm going to go on record as supporting it for right now. I think um, the EMS, that whole crew is being overworked and they're fatigued right now, and um, perhaps we can help get them out of that and then relook at it again with next year's budget and address the fire departments. Anyone else? My, my only issue, as we've talked about, is this, it's a budgetary issue here that, and again, it's not anyone's fault other than how we went through the budget, and I, I take budgeting very seriously, and, and I'm sorry, I, I, it, it drives me nuts when we get recommendations and then we find out mid-year that it's, you know, it's an emergency, and, and so I have to admit I have a little bit of cynicism to me, and I know that's probably not a good thing, but that's just the way I am, and, and really that's what, I mean, I think that's what bothers me about all this, not that I understand the, so, the safety issue and I agree, I mean, if we're going to provide the service, we got to do a good job of providing it, but I think there's things that, the people in town need to understand that again we're we are running a deficit and that's part of the issue and and I think you know again as we're going into the, every budget's tight that people need to understand that you know there's things that we're not going to be able to collect even with a full staff that we're not willing to collect and 
they need to be understand if that's a service we're going to provide then we're willing to again to subsidize the taxpayers with it that's all i want to make sure people understand that we're going to be subsidizing this to provide this service that's my only you know my only stance on this not that it's not a needed service because it is but everything's needed in town so you know and I, i'll just leave it at that okay. deputy mayor suzak and town manager i am going to support it Peter said it best, we need to reach out to the to fire departments. It goes against my grain to use unallocated funds to pay salaries. If I have to use unallocated funds, I really like goods that, that are going to stay for, you know, a number of years. And I think everybody out there needs to understand how this council works. This council works that if we don't get six yes votes, it doesn't pass. It isn't a majority thing. It isn't, you know, a split. This council doesn't do anything unless we get six votes. So I will be supporting this. Anyone else? Chris. Yes, thank you. Uh, as we had previously discussed, this is of critical importance. And I understand probably better than most, having been public safety director for 10 years, all of the issues surrounding um, EMS, the use of fire departments. You know, I was critical in bringing them on as a supplemental first responder, getting medical approval to do that. They weren't allowed to, so that they are on our license uh, during the day. But one of the deficits, and what you must understand, is the state regulates our license and has to approve major changes to it. It takes a long time. It's not going to happen in the short term. And number two, one of the critical components here is we run a 24-7 operation, paramedic level service. The fire departments, for most um, of the departments, can only provide assistance during the day. So you've got to provide for your residents at night. And that's one of the reasons they, you know, basically are doing the supplement of first responder. And I'm open, we meet with them every couple of weeks to discuss it. But we can't wait for that discussion to conclude. So I know Joy wasn't um, present during the last discussion where we discussed this m more thoroughly. I would just say if you really think you don't have the votes to do it, I know that Councilman Arnone and Crisati do support it. I would ask you to table it and bring it back because if we don't do this tonight, we have lost another um, paramedic. We are not only staffing um, less than four ambulances, we're not staffing three. Some days it's two. And, you know, staffing, you have to look at it. Police, it changes. It changes with EMS. But we had 22. Um, they had said frozen positions in the last budget. Let's look with some going less. And now we've seen over the period of time that we've gone, we've dropped down, that we can't address the call volume. So we're relying on mutual aid, which means your residents are waiting now um, on a regular basis for ambulances coming from Hartford. Do you want your family to wait for an ambulance to come to Hartford in an emergency? I'm, I'm not going to be the one to tell them that we decided against that and that they're going to have to wait. This is life and death. I'm not exaggerating it. I'm passionate a bit about it. But we have seen, we've been including it in the PAR every week, we've had an increase in call volume. We have less people to go. We've had eight workman's comp injuries because people are working um, so many overtime shifts. They're fatigued. And as we've seen, somebody left as a result of the work conditions. So I didn't want to have to say all that. But it's that critical for me to prevail upon you that we need to do this now. I promise I will talk to the fire departments. I'll look for other ways. Um, we've already looked and addressed the collection of billing. We had that at the governance. We had our uh, bill person come on to say and talk about are we collection. Do, are we doing that yet? So maybe that's... Are that's we... that's going to be coming on the okay. upcoming agenda for, for billing. We're going to heighten the, the collections. But what I want to tell you in the short term, I don't think we can wait. And um, this also will increase. They project the lost revenue since we've dropped the number of calls they think is about seventy five to one hundred thousand dollars that we're going to lose a year that's about what it costs to replace these people now even if it didn't i would still recommend it so i just would prevail upon you if you think you have the you know the six um to do it this evening but if you don't i would just ask for patience to continue it because this is of critical importance and as i said once we reach a a a, a, a point where we lose so many employees the system's going to be in trouble. And I just want to say to you, we've looked at about you know outsourcing. Most communities don't have paramedic, paramedic level service like Enfield does 24 seven. We're really the best service in the state of Connecticut, one of the few municipal. Because of that, you have control of our crews, our quality, working with our medical provider. Once we lose that, 
you then would have to go to an outside provider. They charge sometimes a million or a million to a year just to give you the service. They make a promise. They don't have the paramedic ambulances in your town. They're outside. You wait for them to come. And then you've dismantled it, and, and you're at the whim of a private company, and the cost just ratchets up, 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 up. So. I think we have a really good service. We work well with the fire departments. I pledge to you to continue to explore. Um, I understand that direction. If we can utilize them uh, in, a, in a way in the next budget to reduce costs, I will do that. I will recommend it to you. But at this point, I really am telling you, we need to replace these people. I don't want something untoward to happen to one of our residents. We're ready to also, any other, Councilor Bosco? I will make sure that I vote yes, as long as I get your word that you'll, you'll A, look into either having an assist with the fire department or private. I, I, we, we cannot be going the way we're going with um, numbers. I mean, it just may have to be that from a certain time on, we, we need to get a private ambulance in here to cover it. Uh, and I've asked for the information. That's why we did the billing. Um, you know that my uh, word is my bond. I give you my word. I'll look at both of those. And again, sincerely and with a, 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 an eye to give you the best facts, not to sway I, the outcome. I, I will. And who, who gave I you the will, blight review committee? So you know we can keep I will, our promises. I will vote differently if I get your word that one way or another you'll keep track of it with the fire department or private or whatever. Because I, I know when we had the last one, when we had the paramedics in from AMR, didn't cost the town anything. The reason why we did it is because it was some of the residents had to pay. And but the we, problem is we may have to do that because you know forty five thousand people. You know, just like I've said before, can't pay for a thousand people. You know, it's just we have to start looking at things different. So. Um, I will do that. We have a meeting with the fire departments to discuss um, a new computer dispatch system, and I will bring it up at that meeting next Thursday. And I've already asked for some of that information about the, uh, the cost of outside providers. That's why I knew that since we last did it, um, the, the costs have gone up. But I will give you all the information, and that's my job, and your job is to set policy. So I think everybody is comfortable with that. Okay. So, and Clay, I have to admit I was... I, this is the budgeting aspect that still bothers me very much. At some point, maybe this is for budgeting. I also, at some point, want to see a five-year history of our, of our workman's comp and disability claims. For the whole time. For the whole time. I'm not trying to, but I think we need to compare ourselves to other towns because I think, and we do hear that as a common theme, that we have a lot of people on disability. Well, you know what? You we, know? Sh we should look at the ambulance, too, because if but It's all in together. Yeah, it's, right, it's all together. It, it have their numbers because if something right. has to happen, we got to go private. Right. Again, this way... We know what the actual right. savings would be to the town of Enfield because we wouldn't have the workman's right. comp anymore. Right. And th thank you for your explanation. And I'll get that information as well. Thank you for your consideration. Roll call, please. Councillor Bosco. Four. Councillor Sakala. Four. Councillor Denny. Four. Councillor Falk. Four. Mayor Ludwig. Four. Councillor Muller. Four. Deputy Mayor Suzak. Four. Councillor Ungeyer. Four. There's eight in favor, none against, and no, no, I'm sorry, it's seven. Zero, zero. Okay. Item F, excuse me, item G. So uh, can I read the whereas is and someone wave the rest of the writing unless you want me to go through everything? Yeah, okay. Yes. So I, uh, re item G, resolution to establish the John F. Kennedy School Renovation Building Committee. Whereas on November 6, 2018, the voters of the town of Enfield approved the referendum authorizing the expenditure of $84,373,294 uh, for the reconstruction and renovation of the John F. Kennedy Middle School. And whereas JCJ Ar Architecture has prepared a proposed plan for renovation, and whereas the town council is authorized to appoint a building committee for the project and to authorize said building committee to prepare schematics drawings, to outline specifications for the project, construct the project, contract with contractors and others on behalf of the town for the project and approve design construction expenditures. <laughs> Moved by Councilor Dent, seconded by Councilor Sakala. Uh, I, so I don't think we need an explanation on, other than this is to establish the John F. Kennedy Building Committee that was passed, the referendum was passed. 
So I, I don't know if there's any specific you want to uh, address here other than... No, we're going by the same time frame we use in the successful high school project. And I think it was so uh, wonderful and fortuitous that you were honoring the building committee from the high school because they are the uh, role model for how we should proceed, the template for this. And I hope you are able to attract just as many dedicated uh, people to that committee as you had on the last one, because I think it would ensure our success. And I'm just glad that we're so close in time that we have an example of the way to do it right and we can use that as I say for a blueprint with JFK going forward and make that a success too. Councilor Falk? I just, thought, just out of curiosity, how, how is the, um, the membership going to be uh, determined to, for the public so they can hear it on TV? Well, if you want to read, I don't know, basically we're going to, I don't know if you want to read it or it has section two to Councilor Sakala's point. Billing committee will consist of nine regular members, two alternatives to serve at the pleasure of the town council. The town shall designate the chair of the billing committee. The committee shall designate its vice chair and secretary. The committee shall act as a school building committee, as a school building committee for the project per, per, pursuant to Connecticut General Statute 10 291 for the applicable regulations of the State Department of Education. There should be four non voting liaisons to the committee. As follows, two members of the town council, two members of the board of education. The town manager may appoint staff liaisons as he, de as he deems appropriate. Any committee member who is absent for three consecutive meetings shall be deemed to have resigned from his or her seat. So all applications for this go through the town manager? like Yes, what we were, we were waiting. We actually had already put up on the website that there's right. going to be a building committee. Uh, we didn't want to actively solicit. Um, applications until you approve this mm -hmm. and that will go up again tomorrow I hope with all the things we're putting on the website it doesn't crash um, but that was our intent so, and we'll, so we'll we'll do a press release press too. Release, right and we were we were waiting the mayor asked me about this and we said we don't want to get ahead of our uh, wagon until mm -hmm. you approved it we didn't want to okay and we are, we are looking for construction related experience if possible all right thank you anyone else have any questions hearing none roll call please Councillor Bosco. Four. Councillor Sakala. Four. Councillor Denning. Four. Councillor Falk. Four. Mayor Ludwig. Four. Councillor Muller. Four. Deputy Mayor Suzak. Four. Councillor Ungeyer. Four. There's eight in favor, and against, and no abstentions. Item H, I don't have a resolution. I don't have. Oh, you just. Oh. Thank you. Thanks. Sorry about that. It is. I, I'm sorry, item H, I apologize, folks. Discussion resolution of Patrick Ward versus the town of Enfield. Resolved to approve settlement of the litigation Captain Patrick Joseph Ward versus the town of Enfield at all, docket number 18-2195, be resolved. The Enfield Town Council hereby provides its consent to the town insurer's Kerma and Travelers to settle a matter of Patrick Joseph Ward versus the Town of Enfield et al. Number 18-2195, an amount of $30,000 pursuant to the discussion with the Town's legal counsel and executive session on November 13, 2018, prepared by the Town Attorney Office on October 25, 2018. So moved. Second. Motion by Councillor Falk, seconded by Councillor Denny. Any discussion on the motion? Councillor Falk? Uh, just a question. I I believe the uh, town is responsible for paying twenty-five thousand, and the insurance company picks up the additional five out of that thirty. That's my understanding as well. Okay, thank you. Mrs. Sakala. So, I have a lot to say about this, but I will try to limit it to a little. Um, this is one of those situations where, like, it keeps you up at night, um, having to figure out how you're going to vote for something like this. Um, the way you feel morally and what's right is not exactly the way that you're going to vote because it's not as responsible fiscally for the town of Enfield. So I need people to understand that this is not an easy decision. Um, believe me, nobody wants to try some of these cases more than me. <laughs> but it's not always in the best interest of the residents of this town to fight something that's going to cost exponentially much more to fight than if you settle it. Um, makes you feel icky, like I said, keeps you up at night, or at least it keeps me up at night. But in the end, it's the financially responsible thing to do. Pro bono? 
I do this pro bono. <laughs> <laughs> well said. Well said. Anyone else? Councilor Bosco. If this goes by what the other things went, we already spent this $25,000 already anyway. So it's not like the town is going to be paying additional 25. We already ate that 25 up. We're already paid. I'm I'm not happy. It just as Gina, this is this is really sickening when you have to sit here and you have to vote for something that's not right. But again, it can cost the town now a deductible that we've already paid or it can cost the town a heck of a lot more money in the end. So you're sort of putting a catch 22 our backs are up against the wall, and I think the right decision for the town is to accept it, even though it's really, like Gina said, icky. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, I just said Councilor's College explanation is, is spot on. You know, so here's where my fiscal conservatism um, gets overweighed by my sense of. I can't stand being taken, and my 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 my, my fairness the, the fairness overtakes my fiscal conservatism, where at some point you either got to do you got to take it on the chin to do the right thing to hope to try to change public policy, or you just continue to allow and I and, and again we do everything here every dollar counts so I don't want to certainly minimize that at all, but uh, it's to a point where the, the laws are not being. Um, in my opinion, being um, enforced for the folks who are actually following the law in this kind of, these kind of situations. So can we, if this passes tonight, since we had some other issues why we couldn't be as, as I don't want to, uh, we, with some of the details of the numbers here, can we make sure that the public understands, you know, again, I know some folks are mentioning kind of high numbers, but really what, in theory, we could be on the hook for, I know it's an estimation. But I'd like to give real numbers, so so it's not just us saying we're doing this because we're afraid of maybe a fifty thousand dollar payout. This is significant dollars that would have to come out of contingency, basically, if we lost. And not that. And again, my sense of fairness wants to go to court and take it on. I, I can just say this, and I'll, the only reason I'm going to talk because it's a broader policy right. issue beyond, and the town attorney can certainly transmit any requests for more details to the attorney. Remember, we're not handling this. Attorney right. Talberg is, but. As we have seen before, and because I was sitting where Maria was, I think I'm in the best position to um, describe the hammer clause. And that's under these cases, we have to give consent to settle. Other cases we don't. Negligence cases or somebody, there's a car accident, we don't. The insurance company handles those. We really never hear about them. But these they require to come to you to have you say settle it. So in this case, once again, if you were not to settle it, then the carrier, and we had previously right. gotten the hammer clause letter, what would occur is they then will say, you could have settled the case for $30,000 starting tomorrow. You will now pay for Attorney Talberg and his fees starting tomorrow. And this case, there was a lot of litigation as attorney Sakala is aware that there's an appeal pending. So we would have to go into federal court and pay his attorney's fees for the appeal. Uh, it's not. It's not. <laughs> no, th about 300 to $375 an hour is not pro bono. So we'd be responsible for that. If it's resolved in our favor, they could appeal it. If, if we were to lose, and he said most of those cases would be upheld, you are then on the trial list. A trial, then, we would be responsible to pay for Attorney Talberg. If we were not to prevail, um, and it was a plaintiff's verdict, whatever that judgment is, say they awarded this plaintiff $100,000, you'd say, well, okay, it was three times the cost. Well, probably our attorney's fees would be equal to that. Then you have to pay the plaintiff's attorney's fees. And he said in the federal court, it's about, as I said, $375 right. an hour. So I'm saying realistically, conservatively, if you were to say, damn the torpedoes, we're taking this one all the way, um, then you had the, the, those convictions, ultimately, you can never know. You could win outright. But the appeal, you're definitely going to pay for that. That's not going to be free no matter who wins. And then if it were to go on to a trial, $300,000, right. $400,000, and you, you have to turn to the taxpayers and say, well, whoops, 
could have settled it for 30, and it was repugnant and disgusting, and, but we didn't do it. And this plays into when we're trying to put more police on the street, yes. more community police. And, and you know, more, I think you know, it's an important point, right. and you've all asked, and I think it's not speaking out of school. We always check with the police department, right. who is in accord with this. We check with the officer involved, and he is in accord that's with what, this. That's important for people it, to It's understand. critically important, right. because I know this council, if the officers in the department said that, no, this is the one you have to take a stand on, I, I think I know the council well enough to say, despite the risk, you would do it. But the officers in the police department know this is not abandoning them. Actually, this is saving them from going through the trial. There is personal exposure to the officers on some of these cases if we were to lose in their career. So they're in accord with it. So I think as unpalatable as it is, once again, and hopefully the la for the last time for a long time, you'll have to and vote to do it. Well, again, great explanation. I think this is important for people to understand, I think, because I think just what we've gone through over the last few years, Yes. I think it's important since we can explain it, you know, because we're not sort of held under some, you know, what we were kind of the gag order, whatever we were under before, that this is not, and and sometimes it, we, again, when we, we listen, we want to put more officers on the street, there is liability that unfortunately, because of, and let's be honest, this is a fr frivolous case, that we have to make decisions because of that. And I'll just let you know as well, Part of it is their cycles, right. and we're not casting or making determinations, but our attorney who has tried many of these cases has said we are in a cycle where juries are very sympathetic to these individuals despite um, right. the facts, despite uh, how strong a case the town is, and the federal judges are inured to be more uh, empathetic and sympathetic to the point where a couple of cases he recently tried where they won... The federal judge put it aside and reinstated and entered a verdict for the plaintiff. Right. After a jury of our peers said the town or the police did nothing wrong. So we have to be cognizant that that's the environment. Maybe the pendulum will, will sway the other way. You'll have a case where we go, you know what? We draw the line in the sand and you know we're in a more favorable circumstance and you say this is, we're, we're trying it. Yep. So, but yep. you know what? That's not tonight. Again, it's a council's a college explanation, Councilor Bosco's yours. I mean, it's, it's, it's almost like, hey, we're making bad public policy because we have to. I mean, I, I, I'm not afraid to admit that the fact that this is something we really don't want to do. Exactly. And, but sometimes making bad policy is the right thing to do. Any other um, comments? Thank you very much for everyone's explanation on this. Roll call, please. Councilor Bosco. Four. Councilor Sakala. Four. Councilor Denny. Four. Councillor Falk. Four. Mayor Ludwig. Four. Councillor Muller. Four. Deputy Mayor Suzak. It should never be unanimous against. Councillor Ungeyer. Four. Seven in favor, one against, and no abstentions. Very good. Um, item 16, public communications. Anyone like to speak for the public? No? You're, hey, yes, Lucia, right? you're sitting there. I mean, uh. <laughs> At least wish us happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> No, it's not a happy Thanksgiving. Lucian Lafay, 54 Kimberly Drive. I just want to express, I try to come to a lot of these meetings, and I hope the townspeople watch this on TV to know what you guys go through. You know, tonight is a prime example. I, I don't understand why Moria's don't have more gray hair than you do. So I just hope the town appreciates Beauty, what Lucian. Beauty, this, right. this council does, and, and to remind them that you guys get zero dollars for what you're doing. And a lot of them don't understand that. You know, to sit here and watch this firsthand in front of me, I just hope a lot of the town people watch this on ETV, YouTube, wherever it gets broadcast, so they can understand what's going on in this town. Thank you very That's much. That's it. Sir. And again, Thank you. happy Thanksgiving, happy everybody. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. you too. Anyone else like to speak for the council? Pam Walter? No? All right. Did such a good job last meeting. I know. <laughs> I declare public communications closed. Item 17, Councilor Communication, Councilor Bosco. Through the mayor to town manager. Um, Chris, we don't have the Christmas decoration thing anymore or a Halloween one. Um, what, why did it go away and what would it take to reinstate something like that? It just brings a lot of goodwill to the town and it don't cost a lot of money. On the town green? No, no, no. Like, uh, they used to go and... People would go put their house in for decoration. They get a little gift certificate. It didn't amount to a lot of money. Mike asked about Halloween, and I made some. And nobody knew. 
Yeah, nobody knew what I was talking about. Yeah. So I'll maybe we'll talk again. Yeah, it was done through recreation. And you know what? It's just a little bit to give a little bit of the community. You know, make people... recreation decoration. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a competition. They have at Christmas. They go around and yeah, right. Okay. And then I think the, the cool request then, is to bring up to Halloween next Halloween year. Halloween too, because okay. some folks did some great house. I agree. There's some great house decorations. Okay, so I'll, I'll track it down. That's more. It's a little bit of pride for our community. Okay. Anyone else? And on behalf of the Anfield Town Council, the town administration, we want to wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving, safe travels. Sounds like it's going to be a cold day. Lons is not snowing, but safe travels, and we'll see everyone early December. 11 degrees. Do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Councilor Fogg, second by Councilor. <laughs> All, right. All those in favor? Aye. Meetings adjourned. Looks like you got a start on Good night, everyone.